Oh. Oh, we're actually going to jump straight into the game. I was going to talk a little about, bit about uh, Ekop there, but I guess we're going to go with Rogue versus Warrior from Kalento uh, versus Oskaka. I, th I think the dynamic, uh, oh. <laughs> I think the dynamic yeah, between these two teams is one of the, one of the sort of interesting stories of, uh, of the tournament. Uh, I know a lot of people sort of coming in were saying that they felt that teams like Force and Boys and Value Town uh, were less likely to perform well because they're not really established units. Uh, but we've actually seen, uh, you know, the Force and Boys do very well. Uh, and then, you know, obviously uh, Value Town with our win last round, we are currently tied for first place. So uh, it's, it's interesting to see how just individual groups of strong players can perform well in this sort of team environment. Yeah, I, I think not only that, but Cloud9 is kind of an example of a team that's under the tag Cloud9. But um, from just like experience talking to a lot of these players, Cloud9 is actually the one team that practices the least among itself. Like Ekop, he doesn't really practice with the Kalento or Strife Crow as much. And pretty much everyone is the, in their own area, in their own region. Kalento was actually in Asia for a while, Ekop, of course, in Europe, Strife Crow in North America. So they don't actually get a lot of time to like talk with each other or even practice with each other at all. I mean, as RDU was saying, you know, it does come down to individual players playing individual games. It's you know important to have an idea of what's going on with your overall lineup, and if you have a particular strategy in mind. Uh, but when it, when it really comes down to it, it's it's you know one player against another, like we have right here with Kalento against Oskaka. Talking about the individual games, what do you think of Warrior versus Rogue? Of like Patron versus Rogue, I mean. I, I haven't really played, I don't really play too much of either side of this matchup. From what I have seen and what I've heard, uh, people generally seem to think that the rogue decks are typically uh, mildly favored, but not by a lot. Uh, the most important thing for the warrior decks is picking up the early weapons so they can deny some of the early pressure from rogue. But the fact that rogue has a lot of tools to clear, uh, clear the board and has burst damage that doesn't re rely on having a bunch of minions in play means that it actually has tools to deal with kind of all of the various combos that uh, Patron tries to get off. Yeah. How do you, I know you play a lot of both decks. What's your opinion on the matchup? Um, I think Warrior is favored. I play like almost only Warrior on ladder because I want to get the top 10 finish. And uh, Rogue seems like a really easy matchup if you get the weapons. And as the Rogue is really hard to win, you have to go with some risky plays, maybe some uh, low tab after you have a board. That's like the only way you win because the Patrons tend to go greedy, so if you have a board, they, they might ignore it for one more turn to get more value, and then you Loteb and you win. They don't expect Loteb, and Loteb is really good against Patron Warrior. That's like one way you can win. Oh, nice. I, I think in uh, actual pro matches, because I have the stats, it's actually 56% to the Oil Rogue uh, with a 24 to 19 uh, uh, match win rate. And I think, um, like, the problem with that, uh, with these stats, is that, like, every time I quote, like, Oil Rogue stats or Patron Warrior stats, everyone's always saying, like, oh, it's because the Oil Rogue or the Patron Warrior didn't play well, because these are the two decks that have, like, the highest skill cap. So I don't know if, like, you can put, like, too much uh, credit into those kind of stats. I think the other problem with these stats is that you're apparently keeping them secret from everyone. You know, I, I heard you talk about these, these stats earlier when I was watching the cast, and people are like, where are these stats from? You're like, I can't tell you. I think you missed the, it. It's supposed to be secret strats, not secret mm -hmm. stats. You know, the strategy. Uh, I see, secret, I see. Not the actual statistical results of games. Well, I, th I think uh, if you actually like went through the stats yourself, like they're not, they're not like completely secret in the sense that you can like actually gather them yourself. I, I suppose, I suppose one could do that, which I'm guessing is how you have the secret book of strategies. Well, here I actually think is a, a pretty uh, a pretty big uh, sort of indicator of one of the cards that's generally very good in Rogue, but is typically quite poor in Warrior uh, in the Patron Warrior matchup. Violet Teacher, uh, you know, Rogue decks that are trying to be stronger against uh, Patron Warrior decks are typically playing fewer copies of Violet Teacher, maybe playing Double Shredder instead. Uh, and here, you know, the Violet Teacher is okay, but it's really pr pretty bad against the board that force uh, that that uh, Askaka has, along with. You know, the the threat of Grim Patron later on as well. The thing yeah. is that uh, people started playing only double teacher now in the recent meta because they figured out that even if the Patron board uh, goes bigger, if you play teacher because of the tokens, you can still blade flurry and kill their board. So teacher acts like a bait in that matchup, and in every other matchup, uh, teacher is like way better than shredder. So people play like either two teacher one shredder or t two teacher zero shredders right now. They focus on heal bots and healing to sustain themselves for uh, a later game. That makes yeah, a lot of sense. Makes, 
I was going to say that. Yeah, that makes definitely a lot of sense. And I think it's especially in the Archon team format where only one out of six decks can be Patron Warrior. Whereas like in a standard like one-on-one -on -one conquest format, one out of every three decks is a warrior. So you might want to tech more towards like, or tech away from the Patron Warrior matchup even. So that I mean, actually like contributes more to like the number of Vi teachers in Oil Rogue in Archon Team League. Yeah, I mean, there's there's various sort of philosophies as to what the best way to sort of handle deck selection for this is. I definitely agree that it's tougher to, uh, or you're, you get less value out of specifically targeting one particular deck like you do in uh, in individual conquest. Uh, though, as we as we saw in you know, the the last match that we just played, uh, you know, targeting sometimes targeting a particular deck can be very effective. You know, Trump really struggled to find a win with his handlock, though. Haha, -ha, he ultimately did. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, yeah. burn. Are you going to take that? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Let's see who wins the whole tournament and then uh, we'll drop the ha ha's. We'll just have a rematch in the final, you know, that'll work out. Yeah, that'll be okay. I don't know, not if Liquid has something to say about that, guys. <laughs> all right, all right. No bias casting here whatsoever, not from anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's actually really nice that like we all have our own horses in the race. That we can like be even more impassioned about this uh, entire league, right? Where the thing like, is that me and Brian are the actual horses. <laughs> <laughs> Calling yourself horses, I like that. <laughs> Here, would you devs bite over fiery wires? I think it's the play you have to go for. Um, I mean, it it is. You do you do set up the uh, the death bite for next turn. You don't really want to use like. Your mana on slam and then not really be able to play anything else afterwards you know because you, you could slam attack with the axe um or you could he, it looks like is he, is he just going with, with the emperor here all right i kind of like i, I kind of like this play actually he the play that's the, oh sorry but yeah no i was just gonna say he has, he has such a strong hand to get the discount on and there aren't that many great ways out of out of rogue to really punish you from this position. I mean, if he does get sapped here, he can just replay the emperor and get another turn of discount. Though he is getting uh, you know hit for a, at least a reasonable amount of damage by this azure drake. But Oskaka only has the one minion in play and can't really develop that much more. Although he could theoretically sap and uh, and tinkers, and that would represent a lot of damage. That uh, that Oskaka right now doesn't really have a great way to deal with uh, without actually attacking into the azure drake. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I really like uh, the play that Oskaka went for. The the play that you shouldn't go for is like slamming Dazedrake and trading and coining out the Gnomish Inventor. Because next turn, if your opponent plays a monster, you're forced to death by that monster. That means you will not play your Emperor on 6. And then you'll probably not get a good turn to play Emperor. So if you just play Emperor firstly, then you can uh, focus on clearing the board. But as you said, Colento can punish Oskaka for that. Yeah, the, the prep sap here is definitely pretty big because it... Uh... It means that uh, there's actually uh, enough mana to play the Azure Drake, which develops a pretty big board that right now Oskaka doesn't have a great way to to actually handle. He can use he can use the slam and then like whirlwind inner rage and he gets a clear. That's two mana, so he can play like Armor Smith and maybe Frothing Berserker and draw from the Bow Rage. Because you you want to keep one frothing to kill your opponent, but I figured out that uh, if you play one frothing for board and you force your opponent to use eviscerates into your frothing, you gain you gain so much more time to develop the patrons and get some lethals. Yeah, I think uh, I think Oskaka can kind of make the read that there's no eviscerate just from like the last few plays because I think you would probably want to eviscerate more the emperor rather than sap it, or is it like that you actually want to save eviscerates for face damage on the warrior? I think that you can uh, you, you go for the sap play when you have like a lot of damage in your hand and you have lethal next turn with eviscerate. But usually you eviscerate. I like I like this. Uh, okay, yeah, he's gonna go ahead and clear off both of those with the axe and the inner rage plus whirlwind. And this also sets him up to be able to battle rage. I think did he have a battle rage? I thought there was a battle rage hanging out in there. Did he already cast it? Yeah, he already cast it. He cast two it. cards. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I was trying to I was trying to figure out where that went. But, uh, but yeah, so now, I mean, Oskaka gets the board clear and has not a huge board presence, but enough that it matters. And he, uh, Kalento knows that that Emperor is waiting in, uh, in Oskaka's hand again. So sort of sitting back and not really pressing the board very much right now could uh, definitely cost him. I like the, I like the Lothab. It buys a little bit of time 
you, you, you can see the, the Emperor come back down and maybe uh, uh, get you back some of the tempo from the, the, the Lotheb uh, penalty, but... Because right now he can't, like, he, he'd really love, Scott would really love to play uh, Emperor into, like, say, Fiery War Axe or uh, Execute here, but the, the Lotheb stops him from being able to do that. Yeah, Can you stop me to go Death by Face? I think that's Death by Into Face here. So you, seven, you put him at 21, and then next time you put him at uh, 17. So you have two Whirlwind defects. The Frauding is two, so he needs to go. With seven monsters on the board twice. This is not math I'm used to doing. I, you know, I, I just, what are you at? Five? Okay, Lava Burst you. That's really, <laughs> that's what I, okay, Kill Command you. Those are, those are numbers that I can add real easy. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. He might have a little next turn if, if Corlento plays, I think, one minion, if I'm not wrong. So Osaka goes really aggressive now. Yeah. And if also, not, he can still uh, use the execute. Yeah. Also, I think uh, maybe Oskaka has done some scouting. He knows that Clento, he doesn't play as many heals in his decks, in his rogue deck, as some of the other players. Like, you see the South Sea deckhand, and normally that's like an anti kill bot or a Farseer. But I think Clento only plays one to two heals, whereas some players, they go as far as to like play three heals, for ex example, Dog. I think Clento plays two, two Farseers and no heal bot, which is like really huge. So, yeah, I can go aggressive. Hmm. So what do you like from uh, from Kalento here? I mean, he he kind of wants to get at least some of these bodies off the board to prevent frothing from really getting huge, but at the same time, you know, he doesn't particularly want to play any of his own minions for the same reason. This is one of the hands where Rogue seems really bad having double sprint without any prep. So even though prep sap seemed like a really power play from Kalento, sapping the Emperor now, he regrets not having the prep. But I think he wants to go YOLO for the All face. Right. That's a line of play that would win you the game or instantly lose it. Yeah, and I think that's just gonna be it, right? Oh, he's not actually going YOLO. He's, he's killing some minions. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, he removes both minions. That's sort of a, a you, you may get two lives kind of play, you know, not just the yeah. one. Yeah, that's I not lethal. It's a little bit yeah. close. <laughs> yeah, I think that play made a lot of sense though, because you saw your opponent, like when your opponent death spites you in the face with a patron warrior deck, you know something's coming, especially with like such a huge Emperor Thorazine discount in the past few turns. Two damage of lethal. I think the play is um, going for Warson Commander, Frothing Berserker, Armorsmith, Whirlwind, attack for face, execute the Loteb and trade Armorsmith into SI. You put uh, 18 damage on your opponent's face. You let him at 2 HP, and he has a clear board, and you also gain a lot of armor. I, wonder. I believe you that that's what happens. <laughs> I didn't really count all that. Oh, he's just, he's just, you, wow. Just using his death spite without playing anything else to the board. Kind of interesting. He just, does he, he just want to kill both things and play Emperor? It looks like that's what he's going for, yeah. So, yeah. that's interesting. It seems like a, it's a stable, it's a like, quote-unquote more stable play, but it also, like, you also see that your opponent has a huge dagger on the board, so maybe you're afraid of just like a follow-up blade flurry, and it's very likely that he'll get the blade flurry off this, uh, off this sprint. Well, he had the weapon, so he needed blade flurry and farseer, and if he has farseer, you just attack weapon into face, and then he needs the second farseer, or he loses, and you can also like top deck more damage. Like you need two damage from the top deck if he has heal and the board wipe, and you have enough armor to sustain yourself because you gain a lot of armor from the smith. So I'm not sure. Let's see how this goes for Oskaka. I'm pretty sure he has a game plan. Just goes with the Thalnos, but then... Yeah, this looks this like... Is lethal. This is lethal. Got lethal. There's like a million minions to play. Emperor lived through the turn. You should play more Green Patron. He's fun. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have enough dragons in it for my taste. Then again, none of the decks that I actually am playing in, in the league actually have any dragon in them, but... Yeah, you gotta work on that. I thought you were the Dragon Master, Kibler. I mean, if they actually had actually made dragons good, I'd be playing dragons. The problem is, most of the dragons just aren't very good. Well, I, I mean, like, you could be playing Control Warrior, for instance. Like, kick Trump out of that warrior slot, give yourself, like, the good class, right? 
Well, when the, when the options are playing, you know, someone gets to play Patron Warrior or someone who has a lot of experience playing Control Warrior playing that, or I just want to play with dragons, I'll stick with Lava Bursting and, you know, Kill Command in people's faces. That's growing pretty well so far. Yeah, Lava exactly. Burst is a good card. <laughs> yeah, apparently it is. It, it's, I bet, like, in the Archon Team League, it has, like, the highest win percentage out of, like, almost any card when it's played. It's really funny to me when people are talking about you know, oh, Shaman's so weak, Shaman's so weak. I am actually undefeated in tournament games with Shaman for literally months. I, I, I haven't lost a game with Shaman in, like, at least two months in tournament. Uh, didn't the, I thought uh, they would beat you in the Vulcan League, right? Uh, he did not beat my Shaman deck. Oh, he didn't beat your Shaman deck, okay. Yeah, he, 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 like, he had, like, I, I remember he had, like, some... He had some like really weird decks that like tried to counter your decks. I actually I actually banned priest against him and then beat him with shaman. It was a, a, like you know the I don't even know the 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 bargain basement deck battle or whatever it was. You know not exactly <laughs> what people would expect. The the, the priest ban and the shaman coming out with a win. All right, so I think this is the first time we're actually gonna get to see the classes from both players, and they're certainly pretty interesting ones. Both players, uh, uh of course, all teams have to bring like that quote unquote sixth deck. So both players have decided that's going to be Paladin, and we're going to probably it's probably going to be like Chalky with the Agro Paladin, uh, Strivecrow with the mid range Paladin, and both of them like even though Paladin hasn't done well in the Archon Team League, I think both players have done pretty well with Paladin, um, just uh, like in the past few weeks. Chalky, I mean, of course, like yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was I was going to say like Chalky, he like invented this like or he didn't he innovated like his own Paladin list, and it's done really well in Dreamhack Valencia where. Both his teammates, Blackout and Green Sheep, uh, made it made it to the finals with his decks, pretty much, or at least the Dignitas decks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chucky added Wargon infiltrated to the Agro Paladin. Chucky always adds Wargon to every uh, Agro deck and makes it the face deck and makes it way better. <laughs> He's the master of the Agro. <laughs> Just gonna put a two two one stealth in your deck and you can't lose. Yeah, he played Priest last week. I expected some Agro Priest, but I was disappointed. But now Chucky is going back to his roots. Playing some aggro, and it's interesting to see that Cloud Nine always played the patron on a different player or warrior at least. Like now, Strife is using it. I don't think he was using it last week. I, I believe Clento was playing a warrior in their previous weeks. Uh, I know he was in the first week when we played against them. Yeah. Uh, one interesting thing is that neither team here actually has a druid deck. Uh, druid has been a class that has largely underperformed in uh, in the league. Uh, it was the uh, last. Last deck standing for uh, for many many teams and couldn't quite pull out a win, uh, but they do. Both teams do have Paladin, which which is you know one of the the less played classes. And Strife Crow specifically has actually had a lot of success with mid range Paladin, and I think he's the only one like maybe in the world. <laughs> yeah, it I feels also like uh, went one I think with the Paladin. Uh, but you were were you mid range? I thought you were okay. You were mid range that one time. Yeah, you, you yeah, played Acro mid -range. Paladin the first week, and then mid range Paladin, I believe, the second week. Correct. Yeah. yeah, and then I played Rogue, and now make Shaman. Yeah, I, I think like because Strife Crow is bringing the Warrior, I think he's more likely to bring Control Warrior because I don't think I've ever seen him play Patron Warrior in um. Oh, I actually besides like a Korean league, I don't think I've ever seen him play Patron Warrior in a tournament before. And That's it's really, like, really interesting. Yeah. yeah, and also like last week or two weeks ago, Ekop was the one playing Patron Warrior. So like I think Cloud Nine just going with like a much different strategy. Usually like. Like Kibler, he only brings like two or three decks or three, two or three classes um, in each week. Whereas like Strife Crow and like all of Team Cloud Nine is just mixing it up all the time. And here we, we are going to see Strife Crow's Warrior to start things off against Forsen's Warlock. Uh, so Strife Crow, I mean, do you think he's going to be playing Patron? I, I actually have seen Strife Crow playing a lot of Control Warrior. He actually played Control Warrior uh, in the the. Vulcan League playoffs, which were actually just uh, just last week. So I actually would not be surprised to see him potentially mix things up. I know that a lot of teams are specifically targeting Patron Warrior with their lineups, and frankly, that was a, a big part of the reason we chose to play Control this past week. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, because if you just think about Control Warrior, it has a lot of good matchups across the board against like some of the most popular decks. For example, Oil Rogue, um, Freeze Mage, and Patron Warrior are pretty much three decks that most players or most teams are going to bring. And if you're already favored against three of the six decks, like that deck is probably also going to be really good. Uh, yeah, what do you think about Forsen? He, he always changed his word. Like, he played Malilo, he played Zoo. Will he play Handlock now? 
Yeah, I mean, Forsen has definitely uh, demonstrated a pretty wide range in terms of his uh, his decks he's willing to play. Uh, the week that we actually played against Forsen Boys, we pegged him on playing uh, aggressive decks because historically he's tended to play decks like Zoo, uh, Mech Mage, and whatnot. And he played Malagos Combo Lock and Freeze Mage, and uh, it did not go well for us. It looks like he is playing Zoo, though. And, uh, ooh, an Owl in Strife Crow's hand would lead me to believe that he is likely playing Control Warrior rather than Patron. I think the Sludge Belcher is also telling us he's Control Warrior. People started yeah. dropping them from Patron. Yeah, there, I've seen Sludge Bel I've seen much more Sludge Belchers than I have uh, Iron Beak Owls in, in Patron Warrior decks. I've generally seen, you know, sometimes one or two, one Belcher in, in, in some versions. It's become much less popular, but I don't think I've ever seen an Owl. Yeah. I think the Owl is kind of a testament to, like, how much uh, Cloud9 is, is expecting their opponents to bring kind of like aggro decks because it's going to be pretty good against uh, Hunter, it's going to be pretty good against Zoo, for example. But even if like they if Forsen brings Handlock, I guess, it's still going to be good. The only one that's not as good against is the uh, Malagos Lock. Yeah, I, I've, I've actually played double, uh, double Owl in my Hunter deck every single week uh, because I think that Owl is just an excellent card against a lot of the popular decks right now. Uh, even as Patron, just being able to shut off things like the draw from Acolyte of Pain, uh, being able to, to turn off Unstable Ghouls, whatever else, uh, just can come in super handy. And uh, you know, I think that, that it makes a lot of sense to be playing it in Warrior right now. Yeah. I think if I had to go through like all the decks that are played right now, I think maybe Owl is possibly worse against Druid. And Druid is a class that like a lot of people aren't bringing to uh, the Archon Team League just because it's been doing so poorly. And the Armor Up Shield Slam from Strife Crow leaves just one power in play. Uh, but Forsen has quite a good hand with Void Collar plus the, uh, the Egg plus Void Terror. So he has a lot of tools to... Uh, protect himself even from something like a Brawl, which, while Strife Crow doesn't have right now, has been a, a super common card uh, that we have even seen two of frequently in Control Warrior recently. Yeah. But Strife Crow's hand is really slow. Doesn't have, a great, doesn't have a great play this turn. Yeah, he's, he has a lot of high-end cards. He may be wishing he had that Sludge Belcher from his opening hand back. Yeah, I think he's forced to use the Iron Beak Owl now. He cannot wait for the Egg, because if he had Egg, he would have probably expect him to play on turn 2. So not seeing the Egg on turn 2, you just play the Owl as much as, as fast as possible to get value, so you can play Sylvanas into Boom into Alex later on in the game. Mm -hmm. Don't you think Argos is better here into Egg Void Terror? Or you play too much into Brawl and he doesn't want that? I, I like, I kind of like establishing an Egg here. Um, I... I, I I'm not someone who plays a ton of uh, of Zoo either. I've actually just started playing a reasonable amount of that uh, on my stream in the in the uh, the immediate past. I actually prior to the Archon Team League, I had less than thirty total games uh, between Warrior, Warlock, and Rogue, which is part of the reason that I play the classes that I do on our team. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, I've generally had a lot of a lot of success trying to establish eggs against Warrior to prevent them from using things like Brawl to leave me with no board. Uh, and I, I like I like this. He he ends up getting you know a similar amount of additional power in play thanks to the the direwolf alpha, but does keep that egg in play in case he is running into a brawl. Oh, no. This is a really awkward turn for Strife Crow. He wants to dis by the four four, but he cannot because of the Void Walker. The Void Walker mm -hmm. is just blocking all the options. And if he crawls as masters, the egg is getting buffed, and his turn is pretty weak. I'm not sure if I see a way for Strifecrow to win this game. Forsen is applying too much pressure. I mean, Strifecrow's hand has really been awkward. He he didn't pick up a weapon until turn five now, and it's not really a particularly good board for it. And yeah, it looks like he's just going to play Accolade of Pain and maybe pick up a card with it. Yeah, but di so didn't he keep two cards in his starting hand? I think he kept Acolyte and Owl starting first, so that's a little bit greedy if he expects Zoo from your opponent. He's well, really I, good versus Molly Dog, though, and versus Handlock. Right. I, I think that, that he may have made his Mulligan decision thinking that Forsen was playing something other than what he, he, he turned out to be. Uh, yeah, because I, I think that Mulligan decision makes a lot of sense, if you, like you said, if you think he's playing either Handlock or Malagos Lock, which Forsen has actually played in previous weeks. Uh, it's a lot weaker here against Zoo, though. Yeah. I think the one way that maybe Strifecrow could possibly come back into this game is if he drops a Sylvanas on the board, it sticks, and then he draws a Brawl, which kind of is like fairly likely given that most control warrior lists run two Brawls. So I wouldn't say it's like completely over for him just yet. 
I mean, he, he does have the, the card from Acolyte here that he's going to pick up. And then... Uh, oh, there's Yasera. <laughs> he's just drawing all of his high-end cards. This is uh, not really what, what, uh, what Strifeco is looking for, but... The awkward defender plus dog positioning. Can't get two power on that egg unless he only buffs the egg. You don't even want to power on that egg. You want to play around brawl. I think you buff yeah. both and you trade with a free free. Yeah, I, I, actually, I actually like the yeah, I like the implosion here. Yeah. You're not gonna even get... if you're never lucky, you still even if you're board. never lucky. <laughs> oh. And there's brawl. So Strife Card did find it, but now this board is not you know, because of that egg and Forsen really kind of defending it, uh, he doesn't really have a great brawl here. At best, you know, he just brawls in his left facing a 4 4. As Monk says, you just jam the Sylvanas in and yeah. brawl next turn. Yeah. Only. I, I, yes, go on. I have no time for games. I was just say, I, I agree 100% that I think that uh. you want to play Sylvanas here. You're at 27. It's not like your life total is so low that you're particularly scared about. Uh, just getting bursted down. You have some time to use your resources better and uh, just yeah. go with the brawl next turn. The not only, only way that, to brawl... Oh, so... Yeah, not only that, I was going to say, like, uh, there's actually not that much power on the board, so you can play it, like, slightly slower than you might have otherwise. Yeah, the only way the brawl would go badly is if Forsen had an Iron Bikal and would silence the Sylvanas, then uh, he would still be in a good spot. Now mm -hmm. Strife will get a lot of value from his brawl. Yeah, I like brawling before attacking here because the two twos, the two two taunts, you're totally fine seeing uh, live through this and potentially give you one of them. And the dog survives, and it gets the dog. So th the worst possible Sylvanas uh, steal here, but uh, it's still a very good turn for Strife Goat. Got a lot of damage of the board. Yeah, he might make a comeback. He can play. Boom next turn into maybe a Sarah. That's a little bit greedy, but first time we go for face most likely, and then he can uh, <laughs> Alex his his face and stabilize maybe. What do you think? What do you yeah. think about Void tearing these one ones and getting a five health guy that can't be death spited? Hmm. Doesn't he wins? Doesn't he win anyways if uh, his guy does, gets death spited because he has like Doom Guard to push damage? That's true. Though it, potentially, it's also protected against something like Whirlwind, for instance. Mm -hmm. If that is in Strife I, deck, I think a Whirlwind has been like cut out of pretty much every deck. So I think that play, the Void Terror play, was more about getting the Void Terror out rather than playing around anything in particular. Right, right. I mean, I, I'm I'm just saying, you know, that that it yeah. is not only putting you in a position where you're better against uh, better against certain types of removal, but also establishes just a significantly faster clock for you. Mm -hmm. but he, I think I kind of like just Grom eat your fo your your uh, Naribian here. I think that you need to use your resources pretty aggressively here to actually just get your opponent's board taken care of. What now? He yeah, will go Grom to is, nine. His, then... hand is, his hand is just full of so many expensive cards that I think he just can't cast cheap cards here. I think that he has to use an expensive card here. Like Grom. Is this, is this not quite uh, legal? No. He needs to uh, tap for... Okay, nothing, nothing he could get. He's, he's Even a second abusive one. Yeah, exactly. If he could, if he could play his entire hand out, it would have been lethal. But he, uh, he was, didn't have the mana. Yeah. Stop Do you even want to trade into the Gromash? I think no. you just go for face. I, I would 100% go for face here. I think this is absolutely correct. Yeah. Now, I mean, strike for his position. He basically has to brawl again. He could. I think. Uh, well, he can play the shield, shield maiden plus armor up plus shield slams. Actually, quite strong. Yeah. Gains him seven, and then he gets to kill the five five. But is that even enough to keep him alive? I think it is. No. Yeah, and n after that, he can just play the Alexstrasza, uh, get himself back in even more health, and he also just has this like huge Grom that he can just like start clearing off even more minions with. So this is actually not in a terrible position for Strife Crow. Yes, well, he, if he goes for the shield, shield made on play, I think he threatens little unless Forsen has the second Argus, which we know he has. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I, I kind of like the shield made armor up, shield slam your 5-5, five, five attack you for 10. I don't think there's really another possible play, really. It's not like this is a particularly sophisticated line of play or whatever, but... Kill your biggest guy, hit you in the face for 10. Generally a good, uh, a good line of play. Would a Piotr deck be lethal? 
What uh, power overwhelming? Yeah. Uh, he has. It's exactly lethal. Five. Yeah, we'd have exactly lethal if he does have Doom Guard plus power overwhelming. But I don't think that you can. I don't think you can try to play around that. I think that you you, you know you're in a pretty bad position here already, and you need to try and actually force your opponent to react to you. That's a pretty good draw. I don't yep. think you need to tap. So yeah, just go for face. With like a worse draw, you could consider tapping since you have like double PO remaining in the deck and you can insta win drawing the PO. But with drawing low tap, you definitely smash the low tap and go for full face, taunting the board and putting yourself in a good spot. Yeah, I like that for sure. Because now, I mean, now you, because of the, the low tap, I mean, Strifeco could possibly play Brawl here, but that's all he could play. And that's not even, you know, not even putting him in a situation where he lives because bare minimum, uh, any one of your guys, unless a, exactly a spider lives. Is uh, is going to end up uh, being lethal with Doomguard. Well, if you had Brawl and Belcher, it would be pretty good. If you had Brawl, and... yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, because of the low feb, even if Strife Crow had Brawl, it's not going to do anything. Oh, yeah, I, the low feb. <laughs> I think I think this is just it. Um, Alex wouldn't save him. Belcher wouldn't save him. There's just not really any other line of play, and it's that's the issue that all these creatures that Strife Crow can kill, they spawn even more minions to get more power on the board. Yeah, he's not actually Force. taking uh, taking power off the off the board with these attacks. He's he's just yeah. You can see uh, Forsen using his Starcraft APM. <laughs> you can see like he was actually like moving his mouse pretty fast. And then Doomguard is just going to be enough to to close things out here, I believe. Doomguard hits that. Oh, actually, he, he's no, he's exactly lethal. Oh yes, he's exactly lethal. He's BMing so hard. <laughs> trying to tilt Strife Crow. That, this might be a strategy, but I'm not sure if Strife Crow will like this. No, just uh, being on a team with Strife Crow previously in the ESGN days, I know Strife Crow just like instantly squelches you if you start emoting. <laughs> so he also has good APM. Mm. Just get the, you gotta get the squelching quick right under the wire before any of the extra modes come out. It's a preemptive strike. He could just squelch to start the game and then he, he totally takes away so much of Forsen's edge. Yeah, that's like a, like a default strategy against Forsen, actually. If I had to write a anti and strategy guide, I would definitely go with that. Also, bring some like anti-aggro decks, possibly. Well, I mean, as we, as we were discussing uh, a little bit earlier, you know, Forsen has demonstrated a pretty significant range uh, in this tournament. You know, while he did play uh, Warlock Zoo in this round, he's played Freeze Mage, he's played Malagos Warlock. He's definitely uh, opened up to a bit beyond just aggressive decks. Yeah, he's been playing like mostly the same classes though. I believe the the mage and the warlock, but like within like those classes, there's just so many different archetypes that you can go into. Like uh, tempo mage, uh, even mech mage, which is a deck that Forsen has won tournaments with. Mm -hmm. So definitely uh, very well rounded is Forsen and Forsen boys. They go up to a, a very early lead, but you know what? They've gotten these leads before, but they've uh, kind of like fallen back sometimes. For example, uh, against Archon last week, I think they got a pretty hefty lead. But they just weren't able to close it out with actually Chalky being the weak leak, surprisingly. There are both advantages and disadvantages of going for an early lead. For example, now if Strife Core Colento lose, they get benched. So Cloud9 might be inclined to go for Echop. And at the same time, if uh, Forsen and Oskaka win, it is really hard for Chalky to win his last two games being the last one from the team because his opponents can just queue the decks in the right order. So it's a double edged sword. Yeah, it is. It is definitely easier to come back from a deficit than to you know end up sweeping in in this format, just because there's so much, so many tools that the the team that's behind has in terms of informational advantage, benching things like that, that can uh, uh, enable them to set up better matchups. Do you think we will ever see a six zero? Uh, I I mean it's it's pretty unlikely. I I I hope that something like that happens because it would certainly be a pretty exciting story. I just hope it doesn't happen against us. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, like I said, the, the there's a lot of advantage to the the team that is behind because they have so much information about what they're going up against. You know, if your opponent has just one deck left, you can just queue your best deck against that. And uh, being able to come out on top of six matches in a row in Hearthstone is uh, is pretty tough. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, like for example, even when Liquid was up five two against uh, Nilhum, Nilhum was able to like queue their best decks uh, like straight up one after the other, and like and after a while, like it became like we've been losing so much that it may even like dishearten the team. I'm not saying that it that actually did happen, but it's definitely a potential for that to happen. We yeah, were in a similar but, situation. Uh, go ahead. Oh, by going for the good matchups first, you can tilt your opponent if he's uh, going for that. Like. If somebody goes goes sad because he's losing for the team and not for himself, he might play worse in other games. I mean, that's definitely true. the The mental state is a very real thing when it comes to when it comes to competitive play. Uh, yeah, you know, sometimes players will feel like they're you know sort of hopeless when they're they've they've lost so many matches in a row. Uh, and in particular, in, in the team format, when you feel like you're letting other people down when you when you do lose, uh, it can definitely get to some people's mental state for sure. Is this a benching match? Like, I think if Colento loses, he's going to get benched. So it's a really important game. And it's a Hunter versus Rogue, so this is a really interesting uh, matchup. Because if the Hunter has a lot of burst and the Rogue doesn't have that many heals, the Hunter is uh, obviously favored to win. And Chucky is the aggro expert, so uh, let's see how this game goes. Yeah, not only is Chucky the aggro expert, but uh, he's actually like brought a new kind of Hunter into the field. It's called like... People have been calling it the Chalky Hunter, and it's been doing really well in tournaments lately. Um, the Dignitas brothers, of course, they they brought it both. They both brought it to DreamHack Valencia, and they both finished it in the finals. And not only that, Chalky's been doing it well with it, well with it in uh, Archon League, and just a lot of other players have been doing really well with it in various other tournaments. And what's special about his deck is basically it's basically just hybrid hunter, but you take out the high mains and you put in Worgen infiltrators, and supposedly that makes the deck a lot better. And it's just Chucky's, Chucky's thing, is Worgen Infiltrator makes every deck better. We yeah. just determined that. <laughs> was that card even played before Chucky used it in the first Face Hunter version? I think Chucky was the first one that made Face Hunter viable, and then afterwards he was the one that uh, put it in every deck. Like, I don't think any, any other pro discovered that card. It's like Reyna discovered Shield Bearer. I think, uh, I think it was used before, though, in, um, in ESGN, like, back in the, like, way back in the day, basically. Yeah, um, but, face, like when yeah. when Unleash first got a buff, people were playing Face Hunter a lot. Uh, this is a pretty awkward spot for Kalento here. You know, he's facing uh, facing a lot of damage, but doesn't really have great tools to get rid of everything without just attacking in with his face. He could, he could use Eviscerate on the Huffer and clear the Misha by by face tanking it and attacking in with the Farseer and then weaponing up. It's probably his best his best option here. I mean, maybe he wants to drop Piloted Shredder and then just kill the Misha and save the Eviscerate for later, but that takes another 4 damage from Huffer. Yeah, I think it's a better line, what you just said. But at the same time, if your opponent has a Shredder himself, he'll take that 4 damage anyways. Of course, you can play low to challenge it, but that doesn't, doesn't change anything. So he must evaluate his situation, and if he thinks he can clear board next turn using the Eviscerate and the SI Agent, then he might just go for Shredder now. Yeah, Oh, and, and he actually doesn't even clear the Misha, so... Yeah, no, this is this is pretty. Uh, given that he would have had to face tank anyway, I definitely like this play a lot more. Uh, he gets to ch the Chucky does just get to attack for eight more to the face and play a Shredder. Yeah, yeah not clearing Misha goes really good for you if you top deck the backstab. Right. Yeah, that ends up being fantastic. But the problem, the problem is otherwise that you don't really have uh, a way to enable both the combo of SI and oh, but there's prep. That's nice. That's actually yeah. That's that's very good. I mean, he can. It doesn't really chain. He doesn't really make anything good to do with the prep, other than enable combo. But uh, it, it definitely helps him a lot in terms of his ability to remove damage from the table. Yeah. He basically gets a, a free dagger. What the is the way to clear this? The most uh, non RNG reliant. I think he eviscerate the four three first to see what he gets, because even if he eviscerate the four three or the or the four four, it doesn't really matter, right? I think it matters um, in terms of yeah. Not even the Nerubian Weblord would matter, or even the the uh, what's it called, the Mana Wraith. Yeah, this is this quite well for uh, for Kalento. A big, big swing on the board, but he is at fourteen life against uh, against a very aggressive hunter deck. He has he's already used one of his Farseers, so not a ton of healing coming out for him later. Yeah. Another thing to consider is that uh, what we alluded to is that. Um, Kalento actually probably doesn't run heal bots in his deck. In his previous list, he's only been running two Farseers in terms of healing. 
And those are mainly for like turn three tempo plays and not for the actual healing. So Kalento essentially is at 17 life right now. He can't gain anything above that. He does at this have point, I think a really good line from Chuck is using hero power every single turn to maximize the damage output. So that means you play Hunted Creeper, hero power, and then you decide on what one drop you want to play. Uh, playing Wargon has its benefits because you deny him some draws. Like if you play Lepernum into Wargon, he might have one or two more draws to get uh, the Fan of Knives. But uh, he decides to go for the double Creeper. A really aggressive play. Really bad versus Fan of Knives or Blade Flurry. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little surprised to see Chucky not uh, not steady shot there. I I think that you're hoping that these creepers get uh, get in at least two damage, but I, I feel like you're probably better off trying to actually just close the game out with burn as fast as possible. <laughs> this guy's toast. Wait, he doesn't blade flurry this? Hmm. Huh? Ah, uh, I. Uh, I don't know what to say. I would have definitely played right there. I would describe this as an aggressive line from Kalento. I mean, does he have the? He doesn't have the ability to clear next turn, does he? Hmm. I mean, Chucky can unleash. He he can even trade with the the Shredder, and then unleash, getting the full four. Potentially, potentially trade with something else if he really wanted to, and play Lapernome, but. Uh, this is this is very peculiar to me that um, Kalento chose to leave so much up. Another factor to consider is that in previous weeks, Chalky has not run Unleash the Hounds in his lists, so maybe Kalento is not having like not considering that at all. Oh, this really? Is certainly played, very weak to Unleash. Hasn't played any copies of it. I thought he played one. Uh, he played none against um, whatever team was facing last week, oh, which was you guys, right? Uh, no, we played them two weeks ago. Okay, in that week he played zero. Okay. Well, that that definitely can potentially inform your play. That's that's one thing that's uh, definitely important to keep in mind in the. Oh wow, he's actually not even really going. For it. I guess I guess Shocky has to think that you know if if uh, Kalento is being this aggressive that he must have some sort of burst damage that he wants to try and deal with. So it was basically just a bluff. But even if you calculate the damage, I don't think even Oil Eviscerate was not lethal. He needed a three card combo to kill him. So I think the best play Chucky could have done is just going full face and then killing him in two turns. So Colento's bluff proved to be really good for him at this spot. Yeah, I'm I'm really I'm really confused as to as to the that line of play from Chucky. I mean, yeah, he, he was facing out a lot of damage, but he just threw away all of his resources to do very, very little. You know, I I feel like he, he really needs to close up the game as quickly as possible, and now he doesn't have really the tools to do it. Ooh, that's a big a big backstab. Allows him to easily clear that and I mean this game is, is effectively over at this point. Chalky has no cards in hand. He's on a, a pretty much a two-turn clock. And he'd have to draw like, I don't even know, Arcane Golem or something into something. Well, I'm I'm pretty sure a lot of quick shots would have to be involved. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of quick shots would you know, could possibly do it, but even even like quick shot into quick shot, hero powering twice over two turns and uh, kill command, I think is actually not quite enough. Yeah, Colento one. I think Chucky threw the game. I don't find a really good reason for why you trade. Like, okay, you trade the board, you you put freezing on the shredder, but then how do you win? How do you deal seventeen damage or fourteen damage or whatever with an empty hand? There's like no way you do that. Right. So, the line of play was just, okay, if you have it, you have it. I just go for face. I don't think you should have played around anything. I mean, and, and it's, it's very peculiar because, you know, Chalky, generally speaking, has been someone who has been very successful and very experienced with aggressive decks. And that seemed like a position that you know, he, he must have, or ought to have, have, have understood, put him in a huge, huge, as a huge, huge underdog in the game. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty surprised at that line of play from him. But that does bring the match to two games to one in favor of Forsen Boys, with Cloud9 getting on the board, and Kalento will not be benched. So it definitely opens up the rest of their lineup as possibilities. Yeah, we actually haven't seen Ekob play yet today, and I think going into this league, a lot of players were um, saying that Ekob would probably be the weak link of Cloud9, but it's actually been usually the other two players who have been failing when uh, Cloud9 has taken their losses. For example, in the first week, Cloud9, they went, uh, or rather, Kalento went 0-4, losing four games with his Patron Warrior. 
And then in the last week, it was actually Strive Crow who kind of made a few mistakes, made a few blunders that caused them to lose the series against Tempo Storm. So Ekop actually might even be the MVP of Cloud9 in Archon Team League so far, and he has yet to play. I, I have heard a number of theories about uh, who people felt the weak link of various teams would be, and uh, those have generally been wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Blair. What do you think? <laughs> what matchup do you think we'll go into? I, I, I expect Ekop to play, and if for, for some boys think of that, uh, Ekop's decks are re really bad against Chucky's decks, so Chucky might stick to Hunter, that might actually be a really good choice in my opinion. But uh, then they go into the risk of getting benched, but sometimes you have to take risks. For example, if you always play around getting benched, that means that you're automatically benching yourself. Right, that's the thing, is that if you, if you try to play too conservatively around the bench rule, you are just opening your, uh, your strategy up to being ex exploited by opponents who pay attention to that. You know, if they're like, okay, well, they, they don't want to get, uh, they don't want to get Chalky benched, so they won't play Hunter or Paladin, but it's like, okay, well, if they're trying to play target those decks, you can play a deck that is good against the decks they target those, but it's like, you know, the Sicilian in, uh, in Princess Bride, you know, I, I can't drink the one in front of you or whatever else it is. Mm. I hope you guys get that reference. Please, chat at least. I, I'm, I'm sure someone in chat gets that reference. <laughs> so right, yeah, Hunter. Be... Ekop with Hunter. Yeah, and against Forsen playing Mage. And I believe Forsen has played Freeze Mage every week to this point. Uh, I, I, we were talking earlier that Forsen had, had a pattern of playing a lot of aggressive decks, had had a lot of success uh, winning tournaments with Mech Mage previously. Um, but so far, he has seemed to stick to his guns playing Freeze Mage every week in Archon Team League. Yeah. Forsen is, uh, whenever you talk to him, he always claims that he's, like, one of the best Freeze Mage players in the world. So, it, like, makes sense that, like, because he's confident in that skill, that he'll just bring this deck uh, all the time. And it's especially true because in this format, there's only, only one out of all your six decks can be Warrior. So you pretty much have, like, five medium to decent matchups. Um, that you you can line up your Freeze Mage with. And it's one of the reasons why Freeze Mage is so common in the Archon Team League, but like pretty much non-existent on ladder. I, don't, I wouldn't say it's non-existent. I face it quite a lot of times. People like Freeze Mage on ladder because people started playing less Patron and more Hunter recently. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but uh, just judging by this matchup, Mage versus Hunter, I feel like... The less aggressive the hunter is, the better chance you have against the mage because the the mage with like ice blocks can just like threat um, deal with the aggression so off so easily. Whereas like bigger threats like um, the the low thebs, the high mains, and the doctor booms, even perhaps Ragnaros and sub mid range lists, they can just be very threatening to freeze mages. Uh, generally, I think, yeah, I agree that the mid-range decks are typically more effective against freeze mage, uh, in part because ice barrier is so good against the face decks. Uh, that each of their cards only can generally produce a pretty limited amount of damage, whereas a card like uh, like Lotheb or Piloted Shredder or Savannah High Main can connect multiple times and do a lot. It also forces the, the Freeze Mage to frequently use their middle turns either digging for or casting Freeze Spells to prevent those huge chunks of damage. Yeah, Judging from this opening hand, though, I think this, yet again, is uh, the Chalky version of, of Hunter. And it's really surprising because I think most players um, or most viewers that are watching right now, they're like, what's the Chalky version of Hunter? But within the pro scene, pretty much everyone knows about it. And uh, it's like the current most popular Hunter list right now. I still like Savannah High Main. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, with the, the loot hoarder here on, on turn two, uh, lets the cat out of the bag and clearly indicates that Forsen is playing Freeze Mage. It's not really a card you see in many other Mage decks. Uh, hasn't really seen play in, in, in many decks, other than Combo, amusingly, because it, it is a, a minion that can help you fight for the board early, and as well as help you dig for your key pieces later in the game. What do you think about Snake Trap? Like, what are the matchups where Snake Trap is really good? Or is it just good when your opponents don't expect it? I think that that it's pretty important to have a, a wide range of traps that you're willing to play in a format like this, just because a lot of them can catch your opponents off guard. If your opponent knows that, okay, you always have Freezing Trap because you played only Freezing Trap every week, uh, you can end up losing out on uh, on a, you know potential value from the uh, the opportunity to 
catch them with something like a snake trap. And while he went, yeah. Ecop traded with the the loot hoarder. That's a little surprising. Yeah. And I guess he, was a, he oh, sorry, used this mad scientist for some reason. Um, uh, also interesting, like, uh, Forsen, I think he played the Ice Barrier from hand, and it's one of those cards that um, I've heard that you keep uh, if you suspect your opponent is face hunter, but you throw away if your opponent is mid range hunter. So I'm curious as to like whether Forsen actually kept that in his opening hand, and like what kind of read he made on Ekop because Ekop has been mostly playing mid range hunter the entire time, but he's definitely like switched it up a lot for this game. Ekop has a really aggressive deck, but uh, Snake Trap is going to be really bad in this matchup. Mm -hmm. Forsen also has like the heal bot, a lot of stall. Now he just needs a uh, Alex Antonidas Emperor. Doomsayer. Yeah, he needs that Doomsayer. <laughs> and that's yeah. He Forsen has a lot of tools to extend this game, and he's still over thirty life thanks to that ice barrier. And this is you know when we were discussing earlier the the pros and cons of different versions of uh, of Hunter in this matchup. I think that you know as we see here the. Uh, the the Ice Barriers are so powerful against the decks that don't necessarily have the big repeat damage sources. Uh, E-Cup does have the, the Shredder, which is hopefully going to get him something uh, pretty reasonable here, but let's find out. Ooh! He That's can now kind of useful. Minions with this hero power. <laughs> yeah, all those Freeze Mage minions, right? Yeah, I mean, he can, he can, he can ping off the, uh, the Loot Hoarder next time it comes out, not have to attack into it. Mm. It that actually would be so non smorkish. You always want to hit the face. Well, it, this actually could be a drawback because this reduces Ecop's ability to play the game efficiently from a time perspective. He actually has to target his hero power now. He can't just mm -hmm. click it. You have to click and drag. So yeah. that, that, that in this matchup, that that minion may actually just have a drawback. Yeah, I think uh, in this like as the hunter player, a lot of times you really want to think about your plays. Like there's just so many things to consider, like how you hit your opponent's face. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually do think that that uh, that people dramatically uh, understate the or overstate the ease of playing a lot of aggressive decks. I think that in many cases there are lots of decisions at the margins uh, that are very important that can decide you know decide games uh, based on you know what you do on any particular turn. Uh, but uh, it is certainly there's certainly fewer decisions that you have to make, but a lot of them end up being more important because they you know you don't actually have that many of them, and each of them is very. Uh, very significant in terms of the overall impact on the game state. Yeah, um, when when Firebat won the World Championships last year, a lot of a lot of people were saying, "Hey, he just like won with like Zoo or like Zoo is such an easy deck." But if you ask a lot of the pros at that time, like uh, Strife Crow and Firebat, for instance, they'll actually answer that Zoo was actually one of the hardest, if not the hardest, deck to play at that time, just because like the amount of decisions that you actually had to make at any given turn. I believe the quote from Strife Crow was like, "Every time I play a Hearthstone deck." At the end, I'm pretty sure like I played it 100% correctly. But at any game after uh, when I play Zoo, right after, I'm like not sure at all if I played that correctly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I've been playing quite a bit of uh, of Zoo on my uh, on my stream recently, trying to just familiarize myself better with more different decks than I have been playing. And it is uh, it is definitely a, a deck that I think people vastly overstate the ease uh, of playing it correctly. There are so many things with minion positioning and you know when you want to use cards like Abusive Sergeant or uh, Power Overwhelming and such that uh, are more complicated than people give it credit for. Yeah, This is actually an interesting position for Forsen here. He has no ice block and he has no, no board clear and he's facing a board of a lot of minions. I think Echo played it really well because he saw the Blizzard from Forsen so he just went really aggressive mm -hmm. afterwards. And Forsen drew badly, as I said, this could happen. You need the card draw early game as a freeze mage player, even though you have like a lot of removals. You stall, stall, stall. But then if you don't get your card draw, then uh, you're not gonna win. You need you need ice block and then Alexstrasza and then burst. That's like the usual order. Of course, games can vary depending on your draws, but I don't see Forsen in a really good spot right now. He's forced to Antonidas here, I think. There's a couple. I mean, he could theoretically like Hello. frostbolt or fireball his own his own mad scientist, but that's not gonna really get him anywhere. It just gets him an ice block or whatever else. He's. I imagine, yeah, Antonidas frostbolt is probably his best option. 
Ekop is turning the BM against Forsen. I know from Ekop, he told me that he never squelches anybody, so he saw whatever, what Forsen uh, emoted him, and Forsen also never squelches anybody, so it's just <laughs> like an emote battle here. And Ekop is gonna take this down with Unleash a Hound. Thanks. And no, he doesn't even get a chance to unleash a single hound. Yeah, I think uh, just just judging by the amount of or the number of emotes that Ekop was like putting out there, I think Forsen knew that he had lethal right there. <laughs> he, he maybe actually just the bluff. into the emotes, which is actually maybe you should maybe you should just take up emotes spamming against Forsen, and he'll just concede when he's not dead. Yeah, I think it. You have to like kind of uh, like put up a persona of a guy who like emotes a lot though, because like if he hears emotes from you, Kibler, like he's like, oh, he's just like. Being a nice guy all around, right? He doesn't have lethal. He's just saying hi to me. I mean, my my you know Twitter name and uh, Twitch name is BM Kibler, even though that has nothing to do with being bad mannered. It's just my initials. But <laughs> maybe I could take it to the next level. Who knows? And all of a sudden, it's a, a tied game once again. It's like just like we were saying, like the team that is kind of behind has more of a chance to like claw themselves back into the game because they can typically queue up better matchups overall. And yeah, so I mean, we have actually, uh, I mean, both these teams had pretty much the same lineups, and now we have, we've not seen the mage from Kalento yet, so we're not ent entirely clear what type of mage that is. Similarly, we, I don't believe, have seen Ecop's uh, Warlock yet, so that's still kind of a mystery. Uh, we do know that, that Strife Pro's Warrior is Control, so do you think that that might be uh, a, a deck that they're trying to line up with specific matchups here, or, or what? It does seem yeah. like some of the some of the better matchups for Control Warrior may already be gone. Those are obviously Freeze Mage. That's what they would love to queue it into. But but what's yeah. the chance of queuing it to Freeze Mage? Like Forsen already lost, so they might expect them to change to somebody else so that Forsen doesn't get benched. So that way Paladin is a really good pick. But at the same time, if they go for Forsen and they get the Paladin into Freeze Mage, that's really bad for Cloud9. So it's a really hard decision for both teams. It's probably just a 50-50... Coin toss. Yeah, I think. What, what are your your thoughts on uh, on mid range paladin right now? Because looking at this at these matchups, like I don't really see a good matchup for mid range paladin. You know, on well, I mean, it's not even clear that there was one when all the decks were there. But uh, but with with just freeze mage, you know, hunter, I assume aggro paladin and oil rogue left for forcing boys. Where do you think the the paladin's gonna be able to pick up a win? Uh, the Paladin is a really good deck versus Hunters, no matter what Hunter type, because you have a lot of Taunts and they usually run 1 or 0 Owls in the Chucky Hunter, which is most popular. And uh, they might also run Druid, so that's a really good matchup. Versus Freeze Mage, you need to play like Hillbot and to get it, to get either Hillbot or Loteb or both, or play Kezan. Playing Kezan makes your Freeze Mage and the Hunter matchup better. Versus Agro Party, you don't really have that many chances, and versus Rogue, you don't really have that many chances either. Warlock is also a really good matchup for the Paladin, but he forced already won with a Zoo. So we're going to see the uh, opposite matchup as we did from last game. Uh, the teams are kind of doing a role reversal right now with Kalento. Almost 100% of the time, he's going to be bringing the... Uh, he's going to be bringing Freeze Mage, and Chaki, I, I would have to think, he's bring, probably bringing the same exact list as Ekop did, because Ekop, of course, he did play Chaki Hunter in the last game. I don't think Chucky runs snake drops though. That might be one difference. Yeah. Well, like Kibler was mentioning, like oftentimes you do have to switch up the traps in your deck just to like kind of confuse your opponent, just to have them actually like play around all the traps in a series. I mean, there is was it there really worth it? Like freezing trap is so much better than snake trap most of the time. I'm not sure if it's even worth it. Like mind games are good, but they don't influence the outcome of a best of eleven series, in my opinion. Like changing too much might just lose you the game on itself. I mean, there was the match uh, that Trump actually played uh, a couple weeks ago, where he was playing Patron Warrior against uh, what he thought was was Face Hunter and ran a gigantic frothing berserker right into a freezing trap when he expected just explosives. So, you know, there are definitely opportunities where you can get a huge, huge advantage from having, uh, having traps that your opponents aren't expecting. Yeah. Granted, that is a case of Freezing Trap being great, and we were just talking about how, you know, that's the best of them. But, regardless, uh, I definitely think that there is something to be said for, uh, you know, trying to get a little bit of edge from surprising your opponents. There's also been a lot of players who, uh, in some other tournaments, they've been running Snipe in their 100 decks, and that's mainly to counter patrons, because like it, it actually like lines up really well 
Like the snipe kills off the Warsong commander and then kills off the patrons. And also, like I don't think it's like that good of a card, but just the surprise value of it, it can instantly win you the game if it gets a good target off. Yeah, or yeah. instantly lose you the game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there you, you do have to balance the you know cards having universally generally stronger effects versus you know how much how much value you actually place in surprising your opponent. Uh, if you are specifically targeting a particular deck or or situation, you're going to have a specific type of trap that you generally want. Um, but you know, for instance, like I I was playing a control mage deck recently uh, on on ladder actually, where normally you, I was playing as freeze mage, and normally they might expect that I would have ice barrier, but actually I had an ice block in my deck, and my opponent, you know, like sorry, well played me, plays Malagos, throws 37 points of burn at my face, and I get just gets ice blocked. And then I just, you know, Illuminator and win next turn. Or not win, but get totally out of, out of any kind of burn range because he was already at fatigue. It was great. Yeah, I was going to say, like, Illuminator into win. That sounds pretty sick. Yeah, Illuminator just it just killed my opponent out of nowhere. But <laughs> Illuminator's been pretty good this deck. Not that this deck is good, but it's pretty good in the deck. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so anyway, in, uh, in the game that we're actually watching being played here, uh, Chalky has, uh, he pounds the table, you know, never huffer. And uh, but is getting a pretty big, uh, pretty big hit in this turn. What do you think about the the silence on the mad scientist as opposed to potentially saving it for something like Doomsayer? I think that having double out, you can definitely use one aggressively on the mad scientist. It's really important to not give your opponent to the ice barriers and the ice blocks. Like as we saw last game, that's the way you win the game. And uh, knowing that Colento also used his coin, he could uh, go for a face and ignore the scientist. Yeah. Well, not only that, but often the silencing the mad scientist is basically like I just dealt eight damage to your face because they didn't get an ice barrier out. Yeah, I, so that's I actually, like a pretty good I card. Yeah, prefer, go yeah, I actually prefer generally silencing the mad scientists because you know if they're gonna if they're gonna doomsayer, they have to have the appropriate tools to actually set up doomsayer. Whereas mad scientist every time is going to give them something that's gonna slow slow down my ability to actually kill them. Uh, so generally, I, I actually would rather have the Silence of the Mad Scientist uh, just to guarantee that I'm preventing something valuable. Oftentimes, when you have like small boards as the hunter player, you might just like kind of want to and like let's say they Doomsayer and they don't freeze your board. Sometimes you just want to go for face because like it's such a small board that you don't care it dies and you value that extra damage a bit more. I mean, of course, now, it depends on the situation. I mean, now Kalento's actually in a pretty rough spot here. He has he has no secret in play right now. Uh, he's facing down a pretty sizable board that he'd really love to be able to uh, to deal with. He does have a Frost Nova and uh, Ice Bear and Ice Block, but he doesn't have that you know that much mana to actually allow him to to you know cast these things over the next couple of turns. He can just Frost Nova and play a secret, which is like, I'm going to guess is what he's going to do. Frost Nova Barrier, yeah. So he wants that to. That is a better play. Yeah, I, I, I like that play. Like, if you would go for Blizzard, and Chucky has the second Owl, he would die to like some extra damage, but this way, he makes sure he freezes the whole board, and doesn't give Chucky options with, from the Haunted Creeper. Yeah, and now I Chucky's think... in a really rough spot. Yeah, all he can do is really just hero power. You probably don't want to develop too much on the board, and... Like you kind of want to get some value off the quick shot, but also that owl is really valuable, and you don't want to uh, use the owl just willy nilly here just to unfreeze the target, for example. Yeah, it's 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 kind of awkward because you really want to save your uh, your owl, like you said, for you know potential in a key moment. Um, he could just owl and, and get four damage in here, but if that is just barrier, he's actually not really making a ton of headway. Uh, the the quick shot he'd love to potentially get a little bit of a little bit of draw off of uh, by emptying his hand first, but yeah, this is a, a little little bit of an awkward spot for Chalky. So what do you what do you think that you uh, you would do in Kalento's position here? You know, he certainly has a lot of options right now. Blizzard looks like the only good option. Yeah, and even Blizzard, if he doesn't get a good follow up draw, he might be in the spot Forsen was last game. And just lose to the burst on the board. Would you ever consider silencing your shredder now to push more damage and get uh, the block the block popped? Actually, you test first for the. So yeah, see the secret. Ooh, snake trap. So 
Not a terribly useful trap, but it does, it does mean that it's interesting. Uh, Chalky checking his trap could be, uh, could actually, uh, I actually don't know that's the spectator checking the trap rather. Because if, if I was in Chalky's position and I could stop my opponent's uh, teammates sort of on the sidelines from seeing what my trap is by not checking it myself, I actually would. <laughs> <laughs> because the, what your trap is to you in this matchup particularly is so irrelevant, but your opponent's teammates knowing what trap you have and being able to you know have the information going into future games is actually very relevant. So the production guy is helping Cloud9, right? <laughs> yeah. Production Bias production guys. Cloud9. <laughs> <laughs> so he actually silenced that even if he didn't proc the block, just to proc the ice barrier. Mm-hmm. He Again, also really like, heads up play. He kind of wants to just empty his hand and get to the point where you know he's able to potentially get another uh, another draw off that quick shot. And he's also just putting putting Clint in a position where if he doesn't have a mass removal effect, he's going to you know have to ice block every turn. Yeah, and even if I he think... does it, he just dies to a top deck. Like let's say he has Flamestruck or the second Blizzard, he goes to seven, and then Chucky has five in hand, so he needs he needs two, and he can also draw with quick shot. Right. Yeah. I think uh, Chalky's like philosophy or motto in Hearthstone is basically like you gotta have force them to have it, right? I'm sure you guys have heard that from Chalky. Oh my god, I, I people play so conservatively all the time, and they're like, oh, I don't want to lose to this. It's like, well, if they don't have that, and you take your line of play, then you can lose to any number of other things two turns later, rather than giving them a, a you know a one turn window to basically have to have a way to deal with your board. Well, he could do that like last game, right? Versus Colento in the Hunter versus Rogue, and he didn't do that. He didn't play for his own motto. And there we, there we go. Chucky has it and uh, sends Colento down and puts Forcing Boys up three games to two. Uh, it's actually the second straight match we've actually seen the Hunter deck take down Freeze Mage. So uh, the we were talking a little bit about that before. Even with the snake trap as kind of a you know kind of a handicap, they've uh, they managed to pull things out. Yeah, I actually think in this matchup it's not necessarily that much of a handicap because well, I none feel of your like, traps are any good anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, none of your traps like freezing trap is maybe the best, but your po your opponents are going to be playing around freezing trap the entire time anyway. And I'll, actually, sometimes freezing trap can be a detriment because you're like as we saw two games ago. Yeah, like heal bot. Like, you're forced to kill the heal bot. You're forced to invest damage into the heal bot rather than the base. Monk, what are your stats on this matchup? How does it go? <laughs> Pro wise. Uh, all right, hold on, hold on. It's, um. <laughs> Wait, no, they're secret. Don't tell them. The secret, the secret stats. No, no, it, it's, it's more that, like, uh, it's less that they're secret, and it's more that, like, I haven't had time to, like, put them out yet. Uh, but, uh, it's actually Freeze Mage is 71% favored against Face Hunter. And it's around forty-seven percent against like mid-range types. See, Light South Hearthstone on Twitter gets it. He gets the Princess Bride reference. Inconceivable. There we go. Wait, is it? Is that the movie? Oh, the Princess or is Bride it... reference. Yes. The you okay, know. Okay. The, the Anne Hathaway movie. Never go up no? against a Sicilian when death is on the line. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I promise I'll like look up that movie and possibly watch it uh, right after this. That's it. Andre the Giant is in that movie. It is a classic. Radu, please tell me you know any, who Andre. Any comments? I, I'm any too comments? young. I am too young for like you know these old movies. Oh my god! <laughs> All right, I think there's like a huge like age discrepancy between the three of us right now. Um, we're like I, I'm in I, the I, middle, I, but I, I, I that always points out I'm very old. Mm -hmm. I'm like. Over thirty, it's ancient. Oh my god! <laughs> anyway, yeah, I feel in like this match. In this match, what's going to happen in this match? There's going to be a lot of classes left. There's going to be, uh, you know, okay. So one class that we always like the interest, most interesting deck, I think, out of everything right now, is going to be the Control Warrior. Like remaining, it has two really good matchups and one pretty bad matchup in the uh, the Agro Paladin, or like at least no. the Paladin. Uh, I think it's fifty think, fifty versus the Agro Paladin. I think it's Okay. Yeah. I've heard um I've I've actually asked Chalky this and in in his perspective he's favored against Control Warrior. Hmm. I yeah, it really depends the, on the, the early agro. game. Yeah. Like Agro Paladin is really bad against Patron. He's better mm -hmm. against Control Warrior, but not so good. Maybe like three, four, five percent favorite, but not even that if the Control Warrior has like double brawl in the really good early game start. 
For example, the, your best play versus them is uh, going Shield and Minibot into Blessing of Kings, but he can just easily have Cruel Dust Master BGH. It's something they play in the deck, they play double Cruel 1 BGH so they can have it. And it also just makes Execute a good card against you when it normally wouldn't be. Yeah. Most of your minions are really small, their Executes generally don't have that many good targets. But on the other hand, they have the Midrange Paladin, which is really bad against everything uh, Foursome Boys have. You actually could have so. stopped after everything, I think. But yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty good point. <laughs> Are you still like salty the, uh, on Trump? No, I, I just it's it's funny because uh, you know like looking at a lot of lineups and being like, okay, what is the Midrange Paladin deck good against? And it, it's good against Zoo. It's definitely very good. You know, very good against Zoo. It's good against Handlock. I think uh, you know, assuming you have like a, a, a quality heavy version, um, and it, it can often be good against you know some other aggressive decks, but. I, I think that it really struggles in, in many key matchups in this format. Is it really that good against Zoo? I think it's 50-50 versus Zoo. I think it's really good versus Handlock, mm -hmm. which you know Forsen might not play. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You're right. That Midrange Paladin is not that great in this meta. Maybe they will get some buffs. Maybe the so, so, announcement tomorrow. I don't know. Yeah, so... <laughs> Both of you are actually on teams that have brought Midrange Paladin to uh, to the lineup. Do you guys like regret that at all? And the follow-up question, are you ever going to bring it ever again to Archon Team League if there's like no more buffs in the future? Well, I, I won with it, so I definitely do not regret bringing that. Um, bringing it in the future, it really depends. I We like to be unpredictable as much as possible, so I cannot really tell. But yeah, it depends on how the meta goes and stuff like that. Like, Patron can just uh, beat it really easily, and that's one of the downsides. But at the same time, versus teams that bring Control Warrior, like Strife Throws, Control Warrior, Midrange Paladin is actually a really good and powerful deck. All right, Kibler, I expect a much more definitive response from you. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I do think that Midrange Paladin struggles against a lot of the more popular and more more uh, successful classes in the uh, in the format, I think it has a couple of good matchups. Uh, and but the problem is that if you if you don't get those or if things don't go your way in your good matchups, you can really struggle in your bad ones. I don't think its good matchups are nearly as good as its bad matchups are bad. Yeah, fair enough. I just think the the history of the mid range paladin is so interesting because pretty much at one point after patron warrior became popular. Basically, no one ran mid-range Paladin, but then there was this one player, um, like Xerxes or something, he got ranked number one EU with the Paladin, with a mid-range Paladin, and suddenly, like, everyone was starting to use Paladin again. Some of the most notable people, including, like, Strife Crow and also Tice from your team, RDU. Um, and then, like, but just after that, after that initial burst of popularity from Paladin, we've seen a gradual decline, and a large part of it is because, like, Trump did so badly with it in the Archon team league recently. I mean, individual results like that, uh, while you know they can be really, you know, really high profile and and uh, lead people to you know draw very strong conclusions. I mean, if if a couple of things had gone differently for Trump, you know, he could have won, and people wouldn't have remembered it this way. You know, so I I think that while I, I do think the deck is is fairly weak in the metagame right now, I, I do think also that uh, that people often uh, read too much into individual results from players or tournaments. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's in the same sense that like sometimes when you get BGH, like it feels really bad, and you sometimes like um, undervalue decks that have a lot of BGH targets because of that. Because sometimes you just lose really badly, but the wins that you get are like way more close. I think yeah. that Strafko is the one player that can make the midrange party and actually work. I think he plays it the best, and uh, I'm really excited to see him play that deck and prove everybody wrong. <laughs> I, I think Midrash Paladin still has, like, some good matchups here and there. I definitely agree with that. I, I, just, I just think that it is, it is a deck that, uh, that very, very, very much struggles in the matchups where it, it, it is not good. Yeah. I think from my perspective, actually, that I think Midrange Paladin is one of the more difficult decks to play because it's not really, like, a control deck and it's not really an aggro deck. It's, like, somewhere, like, ambiguously in the middle. And oftentimes, like newer players, they kind of struggle like with what their actual win condition is. I mean, it is definitely a deck that that doesn't necessarily have a 
explicitly clear game plan. Like a deck like Freeze Mage, for instance, you know, even though there are a lot of intricacies to playing Freeze Mage at the highest level, it's pretty clear what you're trying to do. You know, you're like, okay, I'm going to Alexstrasza you, then Fireball you a bunch of times, and now you're dead. And I have to use all these Freeze cards to get to that point in the game. Whereas with Midrange Paladin, exactly how your win condition lines up against different opponents uh, changes based on what deck they're playing. You, you have to you have to take a very different line of play against aggressive decks, control decks, other mid range decks, and things like that. Yeah. Enough about Paladin, though. I, I think there's going to be a warrior and a rogue in this matchup, and uh, typically, I think this matchup favors the warrior by quite a bit, at least the control version. Yeah, the way the, the way the rogue wins is by having like a, an early sprint either on turn four with prep. Or just playing all his hand and then drawing into sprint on turn seven. That's a card you usually keep in this matchup. But on the other hand, the warrior can easily win by applying enough pressure, using Harrison, using Gromash for the clear. Because how is the all gonna deal with a uh, Gromash? He has to sap it and then you just replay to kill one more threat. So warrior is like 65, 70 percent favored. But uh, a rogue player like Muskaka can definitely take the game. Pay attention, class. Yeah. It, it often feels that you need like a specific combination of cards to like actually get in the game, and I think Valley Teacher at least is a pretty good start. If your opponent can't deal with the Valley Teacher, uh, like Strife Crow, I don't believe he can right now, then there's like still a quite a decent possibility of just like building up such a board that the Control Warrior just can't deal with turn after turn, and then the Valley Teacher just gets so much damage in. What do you think about the Harrison Jones right now? You know, like you said, Strifeco doesn't really have a great way to deal with this this Violet Teacher on the board. Uh, Oskaka has a poisoned up dagger. It's not a tinkered dagger, but it is it is already uh, you know a, a card that has some investment into it. What do you do? You like casting the Harrison this turn or saving it for another time? There are benefits and uh, contra arguments of playing Harrison. The, the best benefit is that you directly counter the Violet Teacher and you kill a 3-1 Dagger, which is really important. The counter benefit is that he can uh, play a lot of spells, get 1-1s one on the board, which you cannot deal with. Mm -hmm. And uh, going for Fire Warrax to execute is like, looks safer, but I still think Harrison is the better play. Yeah, I, I, I definitely was thinking that if I were in Strife Coast seat, I would play Harrison there, and he looks like he makes the same decision. And Askaka does not have an easy clear for this Harrison. He doesn't have uh, an Eviscerate in his hand. Uh, he looks like he's just going to go with Azure Drake, Yeah, which leaves that Harrison up. Ooh, a backstab? Is that... Is that uh, not quite no, really enough. Really, no, he, he needs one more spell power with uh, to actually get the uh, the Harrison down. Yeah, that's really unfortunate, especially because Oskaka, again, he's unfavored in this matchup. And the Vi Teacher is one of the ways that can, he can actually like make it somewhat of an even game. But he's like, uh, like because of that Harrison Jones, now he, uh, and, and just like how it lines up with all the cards in Oskaka's hand right now, it's just like he loses that potential to get back into the game. Also, like, uh, the, the rogue decks at the moment are not built in a special way to beat warriors. If you really want to beat Contra Warriors, you have to have double Shredder, no Healbot, maybe no Farseer, and go for the Van Cleef. You need the power plays to beat Warrior. You need aggressive, powerful monsters. And uh, the current meta game forces you to run Healbot and Farseer, and maybe no Van Cleef and stuff like that. Not only Van Cleef, but also I think Assassin's Blade is like one of the cards that you like makes the matchup a lot better as long as it doesn't get Harrisoned. Uh, like back in like the old Miracle Rogue days when Miracle Rogue was first coming out. Uh, Kalento was pretty much the only one playing Miracle Rogue, and he actually teched in one Assassin's Blade just to deal with all the warriors that he was facing. Assassin's Blade like always beat me when I played Priest. I just always lost to Assassin's Blade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's a really powerful card that uh, seen some comeback recently on Ladder at least. I think Mr. Yagut is the one that started playing it a lot. But it's really it's, susceptible to Harrison. But you can bait out Harrison with a free one dagger and then play the weapon and go really aggressive. Yeah. I've noticed like pretty much there's two main lists of Rogue going down. One that is based around uh, Mr. Yagut's list and one is that the one uh, the other one being like the more common one with like Farseer, Heal Bot, uh, three, four drops. And it's really interesting that some players really prefer the Yagut list while other players prefer the other list. And I was mentioning um, in the cast last week where RDU, you played Rogue against Nyria's Freeze Mage, I believe. 
And I kind of felt like Mr. Yugooslis would have been slightly better against the Freeze Mage with the Assassin's Blade. Whereas that just with that week in particular, you happen to be playing Rogue. Whereas if Tice were playing Rogue, he would probably bring Mr. Yugoot's list and thus have a better chance in the Freeze Mage matchup. Well, I didn't bring that because Liquid plays a lot of Harrison's and I don't want to insta lose the game to Harrison. That was the reason yeah, why I didn't have Assassin's Blade. But it ended up being bad because I had to play Rogue into Freeze Mage, which is a really weird matchup. Because you need to either go super aggressive or have like double heal bots as Dog is uh, usually playing. So, yeah. So that was a pretty good turn there from Askaka being able to clear Strifecrow's board, but Strifecrow just has a lot of resources left here. He has, uh, he's gonna clear the, clear the Blood Mage, and it looks like he's just going Shield Maiden into Shield Slam. Well, oh. is on the clock to get that sprint, he needs it as soon as possible. Oh yeah, for sure. He has his hand is pretty weak. He has the the fan, which you know it, it does cycle, but doesn't really give him any any meaningful board presence. And he really needs to to get on the board before all of the powerful legendaries and strife crows that come online. Yeah, he doesn't as have the, much as the game goes on. Yeah, strife crow just keeps armoring up, and every time strife crow armors up, that you know counters one of uh, Oskaka's damage spells. So the longer the game goes, the, the the better it is for the warrior player in general. Yeah, one of the only ways to win this matchup is to develop a board that the control warrior can't deal with. But it's just been unfortunate that Strifecrow had just has one answer for everything that or for every threat that Oskaka has put out, and it's going to be like that for the next few turns as well. And Oskaka finally giving up on his coin. <laughs> <laughs> I thought coin was supposed to be good for Rogue, but Askaka is just hanging on to it for dear life. Well, he wanted to get the extra points that you get from winning the game with coins still in your hand. Yeah. Is that a stat we're keeping track of right now? You're the stats guy around here. I wouldn't know. They're secret. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I haven't been keeping track of stuff like, like the important stuff, like blowback, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I, I feel like I, I wish I played more Warrior and Rogue and Warlock so I could, I could pad my blowback stat. Yeah, you probably have something like close to a zero blowback strap because you I, no, I, I, have, I, have, I have glaive throwers or whatever. Oh, uh, glaive zookas. zookas. Oh, and you have uh, power maces. And you don't they, even have doom hammer. You don't even have doom hammer. I don't have doom yeah. hammer. The other deck that I did play in week two was uh, was druid, and I can hero power into into minions' faces. So, oh, that's fair enough. At least you don't play like mage all the time, and then you would pretty much have to like be playing echo mage and then uh, ping yourself in the face <laughs> in order to like get some blowback score, I guess. Thought steal some weapons here and there. <laughs> all right, so here, uh, Strife Crow is in a really good spot here. You know, he's at he's at thirty effective health. Oskaka is only at sixteen. Strife Crow has a huge hand of. Uh, of minions and isn't really at any threat of dying. He, he it looks like he recognizes that and is just going aggressive. Oh no, he does I not like, go to the face. Okay. I like this play a lot because if your opponent has sap, he's forced to use sap on this, and then you can develop the Isera. Also, I liked him playing Gromash the the past turn because again he has to use sap, he has to use removal to get rid of Gromash while you just clear an Azure Drake, so you are in total control of the game. Now Osaka needs to draw cards and also deal with the board, which is impossible because you don't have an infinite amount of mana. Yeah, you don't want to really like necessarily use Grom as a finisher in this matchup. You just basically have to grind your opponent out because your deck is just overall, if it gets to the longer game, you're just better than your opponent's deck. I mean, I think generally speaking, people underuse Grimash as just an actual removal minion. Uh, lots of times people will, will end up holding it until you know they, they are able to one turn kill their opponent with Cruel Taskmaster or Death Spite or whatever else. Uh, but in a lot of matchups, it's just very effective at clearing out an opposing minion and giving them a huge threat they have to deal with right away. Yeah, I think it uh, goes back to the times when you pretty much, that was like your win condition for Control Warrior. And everyone was basically relying on Alex Straza into Gromash to like finish off the game. Whereas well, they, like these days, it's a little different. They buffed Dr. Boom, four Boom Bots. Oh, that would be sick. <laughs> that's the announcement for tomorrow. Yeah, that's the big uh -huh. announcement. Twenty seven. And also make, make him a 6-7 to make up for the... Uh, to make, yeah. They, they, they so want to exactly balance him. Balance, so they give him more yeah. Boom Bots, but take away a point of power. There we go. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Oskaka cannot deal with the buffed Dr. Boom. And it uh, looks like we are 
at three to three, even score here. Yeah, I think that's exactly the matchup, or at least one of the matchups that Striker was hoping to queue into with the Control Warrior. And now that the Control Warrior has done its job, I think we have to go back to harping on that Paladin that we all consider to be the weak link for Cloud9's uh, lineup. As I said earlier, I'll, I'll keep my position. I think Strafco is the best uh, mid-range Paladin player out there. Like, at least in the Archon League. Uh, in the Archon League roster of players. So, if there's somebody that's gonna do good with that deck, it's him. We might also see, like, Agro Paladin. We saw Strafco playing that on ladder. He even made a guide for an Agro Paladin deck, so... Don't get too surprised if we see that, even if Strafco is not the usual Agro player you would usually see. And that's actually something that is, is worth keeping in mind when... Uh when you're actually setting up your lineups for these sort of things. For instance, uh, Dog has played Freeze Mage for our team in every previous week, and this week we had him play Mech Mage, um, mostly because we wanted to get as many Fel Reavers into our decks against your big game hunters as possible. Um, but also just because, you know, our, our, our opponents, you know, will suspect, okay, he's played Freeze Mage almost every week, he's playing Mage, it's probably Freeze, uh, and there's some opportunity to take people by surprise like that. So uh, it could be that people uh, will expect that Strife Crow is playing mid-range Paladin and will uh, end up getting surprised if he is playing aggressive. Yeah. I mean, there might be, like, some decisions you could make earlier on in the game um, as to, like, whether it's mid-range or aggro. Like, for example, you're more likely to um, owl a shielded mini bot early on or just, like, something that's, like, buffed up against the aggro Paladin, whereas if you save your sign or if you use your signs too early against mid-range Paladin, you can really get screwed over by, like, a Tyrion that comes later on. So definitely there's, like, opportunities for mind games to, um, regarding what kind of Paladin your opponent brings. Mm -hmm. And in particular, uh, in... in matches against decks that are partic uh, particularly aggressive, uh, the mulligan matters a lot. You generally won't want to keep a card uh, like, say, uh, I'm trying to think of a card that I wouldn't want to keep against mid-range that I would keep against aggro. But you don't want to keep like an anti-aggro card, generally speaking, against mid-range paladin. Cards like, like Zombie Chow are generally still good because they do contest the, the board for some of the early minions. Um, but you know, maybe something like Ice Barrier, for instance. We talk about this with Freeze Mage. Ice Barrier is very good against aggressive decks, uh, but you would never in, in, in you know, a million years keep that against Midrange Paladin because it's just not a particularly strong card. Uh, so that, that sort of thing can really be potentially game-deciding, uh, even just in the mulligan stage. I think that Emperor is the most uh, good, is the best example for that. You want Emperor versus Midrange Paladin all the time, but you never want it versus Sagra Paladin. Yeah, that is definitely a good example. What about Alexstrasza? I think it's a good keep versus Midrange Paladin because they are really slow. But versus Agro Paladin, it should probably be a bad keep, even though you want it on turn 9. <laughs> it's just the question of whether you get a turn 9 against the aggressive Paladin decks. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need to survive. So both teams have their mages left, both teams have their Paladin lefts, and uh, we have the Warlock from Ecop and Oskaka's Rogue. We haven't seen Ecop's Warlock yet, have we? I don't believe not really, no, no. Yet. So. Generally, Ecop has tended toward playing aggressive decks. He's played Zoo in previous weeks, I believe. Uh, yeah, but that yeah, he did. Still be any number of different decks. But the thing is that before Archon League, he was a really known handlock player, one of the most known handlock players. I did not yeah. know. <laughs> I think he's definitely like able to play a variety of decks, and I think just overall. Ekop prides himself, like, if you just hear any of his interviews, he always says that, yeah, I can play anything, and it's, like, one of my strengths, um, that I'm so well-rounded, and I'm not a specialist like some other players. And one it's, of my like, strengths I'm so good at everything. Yeah. <laughs> humble, humble brag right there. Yeah. It's like uh, when go. you go into a job interview, and you're like, hey, what's your weaknesses? I'm too good at everything. I, I just, I, I work too hard. It's mm -hmm. terrible. God. Uh, but what do, you, what do you expect to see next? What do you uh, what do you think are the considerations each of these teams? Oh, well, we're going to see what it is anyway. It, it is Paladin versus Paladin. So we actually what don't know for sure, I believe, that Chucky is playing Agro Paladin. We've just kind of assumed that so far. No, it hasn't no. come out yet. I, I think we don't know for sure if Strafko is mid-range. I'm pretty sure Chucky will never play mid-range Paladin. He was <laughs> yeah. bashing on the deck so hard. That's, yeah, that's if you like, there. if you watch any of his stream, he's always ba bashing on the mid. Like he's like, why would you play mid range when you can play aggro paladin? <laughs> <laughs> the thing I want to see is mage versus mage, freeze mage versus freeze mage mirror match at five five. That would be something really nice. 
I'll just I'll just like take off if we're we're at that point. You guys can do the commentary. I'll go take a nap. Uh, <laughs> and ooh, it is we see blessing of mites on both sides of the table. So it does appear that Strife Crow has gone to the dark side and uh, is playing aggro paladin rather than mid range. I like this decision a lot. Um, it's basically just saying, hey, I can be a little bit more unpredictable, and mm -hmm. but I can still like probably like overall bring a stronger deck compared to like what everyone else is thinking at the moment. But I've actually never cast this matchup before. It's, it's going to be an interesting one, I guess. I mean, every really? Sagro Paladin, they always just play all these cards that seem so bad, and then suddenly I'm dead. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> Consecration is the most important card in this mirror match. I played a lot of Agro Paladin, so. I have a, quite a good idea how to win the mirror. You just want to gain the most value out of your trades and uh, try to play around Consecration a little bit while you mulligan for Consecration for yourself. Both players start off with a Divine Favor. Any bets on how like many cards Divine Favor will draw in this game? Zero. It's like yeah. the worst card in this matchup. Yeah. And uh, Strife Card does find a one drop. Uh, which is, I imagine, going to come down. You're probably not looking to try and get a little extra value out of that uh, that abusive sergeant here. So Both players I'm also sure. with Juggler Muster in their hands, which seems like a much more significant card than Divine Favor. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there wasn't a secret uh, for either of these players early on, as was kind of hinted by the overlay. Yeah. Paladins don't really play secrets. I tried making out a Paladin with Med Scientist viable, but... The value of the one mana secrets is just too low to afford running that. And now Strifecrow is in a really tough spot. He needs to iron bake all that. And he'll still get mustered for battle. Yeah, it's definitely he definitely wants to try and play around the possibility of muster, which as we know and as we see now, Chucky does have. Uh, but this this does leave Strifecrow still very far behind on the board. And uh, he will be looking to pick up a Consecration, as you were talking about before. That actually was a good pickup, that, uh, that Deckhand. He can actually muster coin Deckhand and kill the Knife Juggler and kill uh, one of the recruits on Chalky's side. And that's exactly what he does. Was there any merit in like keeping the hand and going coin Juggler muster next turn? Or you just get destroyed by Blessing if your opponent has it? You're just so far behind there. I don't think that this is a matchup. I mean, you would know better than I, since you you've definitely played much more of this. But it doesn't feel like a matchup where you're trying to maximize value like that. It feels like you're you're you need to play for board presence as much as you can. And there is the the blessing of kings, leaving Strifecrow with no board. And Strifecrow does not have a true silver to deal with this right away. Ooh, an owl is a very nice pickup, though. So he actually is able to. <laughs> you see, Strife will give a little nod of approval, <laughs> drawing his second owl right on he time. He agrees. And uh, does it, the juggle hit? It does. And <laughs> Chucky with the the roll of his head in disapproval. Well, it doesn't really matter. It's like one damage to the face if he has to trade or just go for face with his weapon. Yeah. Not a, not a huge difference there. I think it was more the owl that he was uh, he was distraught by the fact that it was the second owl Strife Cross played. Yeah, it's a camera delay, I think, and also that now he's forced to deal with the juggler. He's like the best card in the mirror, so you have to kill right. it. And if you kill it, he'll just go and destroy you because he has the board, and then he can even extend the board even more. Yeah. So here, I mean, Chucky could, if he does want to clear the juggler, he can play True Silver Champion and kill it. But that's like his entire turn. I wonder if he's actually just gonna go with Muster here. I, I kind of like just playing Muster make a guy after killing, yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless, if, if Strike has a second Muster here, this could be a total disaster for Chalky. But other than that, you know, the, he's, he's only getting so much value out of his, uh, his juggler. I think you have to Kings. Yeah, I, I definitely like Kings here. Yeah. It's more worth it than just uh, killing one more extra dude, I think. And you also get like maybe Divine Favor value next turn. You play what you draw in Divine Favor, maybe draw like two cards. That's what you want to achieve usually with a Divine Favor. And you just do so much damage with, with the Blessing of Kings here too. You know, you're hitting for nine this turn and it's going to be difficult for your opponent to actually clear the minion unless he has a, uh, an Iron Beak Owl, which you think he might have played on your juggler the previous turn as well, if he's just trying to neutralize its threat. So I, I think you definitely just Blessing of Kings attack and clear a minion. 
with the muster weapon. You've got to you've got to clear the non-matching one. Oh. You can't you can't let him have some gold ones and, and one that isn't gold. That's just that just at least it drives me crazy. <laughs> uh, so it looks like this will be a face tank. And yeah, and that's like seven damage. But like the prediction, like I think your your prediction about Define Favor was a little bit off because at least one of these Define Favors will draw one card, right? <laughs> and I think that's what might happen next turn. Yeah, Divine Favor is not usually the card you want to play. Like if he draws a four drop and the chances is, the chances say that he will draw a four drop, he will probably see that four drop plus zero power being played. Like Consecration is the best top deck now. And being Strife Crow, let's see what happens. Arcane. Oh. That's nice. Uh, it's not bad. So do you can... draw for one? Or do you hero power? You might hero power over drawing for one. Yeah, maybe. A, th a hero power is pretty valuable right now. Yeah, because the opponent doesn't, ha doesn't have the Light Justice, he has the True Silver. Right. Yeah. So your opponent doesn't have any like just particularly easy way to get rid of your 1-1. One -one. I think I like Arcane Golem, face you, hero power, and then just kill the abusive sergeant with your weapon. Yeah, I think that's what? the play. Because Paladin don't, Paladins don't have a way to deal 5 damage. They have ways to deal 4 and ways to deal 6 with Leroy. So I don't think that extra damage is important on the face. On the other hand, yeah, you want to kill the 2-1. Alright, looks like he goes for Divine Favor, wants to get the cycle. Finds a Consecration. Okay. He's debating what he wants to hit here now, though. I guess I guess he's he with consecration. He doesn't want to face tank there. Yeah. And there's another there's our king over Chalky. Yeah. He can I also draw one card. The, the, I think the rationale behind divine favoring last turn was that if you think your opponent doesn't have a divine favor and he just like plays out all his cards in the next turn, then you'll get zero cards from your divine favor. Yeah, it could it could end up getting strand in your hand theoretically. It's a really awkward spot for both players. Mm -hmm. It will go to top decks probably. And this is a situation where Strife Crow is pretty significantly ahead on life. It's 17 to 6, though he is facing a true silver champion, which is a 6 point swing. It really depends what he runs in that deck. If he runs Leroy, it, he's obviously favored. If he runs no other charges than the one Arcane Golem, he might be unfavored because Chucky can clear what Strife Crow plays and then play his own board. Mm -hmm. Chucky seems really upset. One of the issues um, in this matchup is, or just with the Agro Paladin deck, is that Agro Paladin, they don't typically have a lot of natural charges in their deck, so you're forced to run like Arcane Golem and South Sea Deckhand. But besides those like four, possibly five charges, you don't have like anything straight to face. So it's like quite possible you just get stranded with your opponent at 4 or 3 HP, for example. Yeah, but at the same time you have Divine Favor, which is like a really good way to draw cards. Wow. This is gonna be interesting. So, so Strife Crow missed lethal last turn. What? <laughs> because he, he didn't attack with his uh, weapon. So if he did attack, he would have had lethal this turn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> If Chucky runs Argus, he might have a chance. He probably wins if he runs Argus. But he, he, def he, does, he, he doesn't Argus. have Argus. Uh, nope, it is his mascot, Worgen Infiltrator, which is not really what you want at turn 9 at that position. So uh, Strife Crow wins the Paladin battle. And uh, we, have, we have a fourth commentator here. Shiro came to visit, so... <laughs> Hi. Oh, there's two Shiros. Wow. Yeah, there's, there's the exciting. actual Shiro and then, you know, the, the, the totem of Shiro over there, so. Yeah, and then the Shiro, cheering which I'm sure is being spammed at some point by some of my subs. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, like, we were kind of predicting that the mid-range Paladin from Strife Crow would be, like, the weak point. But it was actually, like, Aggro Paladin and it actually got a win. So I would say, like, Cloud9 is pretty heavily favored in the rest of the matches so far. Yeah, they have uh, they have Kalento's Freeze Mage deck left, and then still the uh, the unknown Warlock deck from Ekop. So we don't know whether that's Zoo, though we've sort of felt like it, it most likely is, uh, just given his sort of uh, recent tournament play, at least. Uh, so what do you what would you expect to see the teams put up next? 
I would expect uh, Ekop to go for the Warlock because it's a really good uh, way to use the switch price factor at this score at 4 3. If you win, you go 5 3. It's uh, probably easy for the Freeze Mage to get a win in the, the last three games. You have a mirror match, a pretty bad matchup. And then you have a good matchup versus Rogue. Actually, the, the matchup versus Agro Paladin is really questionable because people that play a lot of Freeze Mage say it's easy for Freeze Mage, and uh, people that play a lot of Agro Pali say it's easy for Agro Pali. So it might go 50 50. Um, I've, I've asked Chalky about this matchup too, and he says that it's actually Freeze Mage favored. So, like, even though it might be like uh, questionable, I think the mindset that he's going into this matchup. Uh, Agro Paladin versus Freeze Mage because he thinks that he's at a disadvantage and might cause him to play a little differently. Yeah, I mean, definitely, if you don't feel particularly confident in a matchup, you may uh, you may take certain risks, uh, or at least in many cases, you probably ought to take certain risks if if you are disadvantaged in matchups. That's something that I see a lot of players uh, not necessarily do. Is you know, look at look at a, a particular matchup they're in, and they will often play really conservative. Uh, you know, try and play around things when, if the game sort of extends to its most likely conclusion, just sort of statistically speaking, that they're a huge underdog. Uh, you know, for instance, like some decks against like Handlock, people will basically always try and play around Molten Giants. And in many cases, you know, in, in a deck that's that's not favored against Handlock, that doesn't necessarily have great tools for closing out the game past those taunts anyway, uh, you're often just best off just bursting your opponent down and try and kill them as fast as possible just in case they don't have them. Yeah. I, I was think one of that players. I always played around Moltens, and I lost some games in tournaments where uh, if I went for face, I would have won. And since then, I always just go for face. <laughs> I don't really care about Moltens. Like, it worked today. I, I won two games versus Handlock by just ignoring their Moltens. Once he had two, and I had the second Hunter's Mark top deck. And uh, once he had none, and I won. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if you um, if you like realize, but if you didn't top deck that second hunter's mark, you would have been actually in a lot of trouble. Because well, like, if, he if he if he wouldn't top deck the second molten giant, he would be in a lot of trouble too. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Touche. Yeah. Goes both ways, really. Like when they have five cards or six cards in their hand, you don't really expect them to have double mo double molten taunt and heal bot and whatever else. Because that's like a really small chance of happening. So just going for face and forcing them to have the out is the right play most of the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I'm really it, curious it, what type of handlock, what type of warlock uh, Echo is playing if he's playing handlock or zoo. Yeah, definitely. I mean, th that is, as we've mentioned a number of times, warlock is is one of the classes that can have so many different varieties of, of decks, and even even within particular sort of archetypes, you can have a lot of a lot of variation. Uh, you know whether you're playing a uh, void caller handlock or you're playing Ragnaros or you're playing uh, Jaraxxus. and then even even in zoo you know there are the the more aggressive zoo decks that play Lepernome, there's the more demon focused zoo decks uh, and we will see it here we have Ekop coming out against Forsen so uh, Forsen's freeze mage deck he did uh, fall earlier to uh, to the hunter and uh, we'll see how this is going to match up. I, it I really depends. He saw there's a freeze mage though. He's not really into that class. <laughs> <laughs> it really depends. I would say Zoo is unfavored versus freeze mage, but on the other hand, Handlock is favored, and uh, Malilok is kind of like a uh, slightly unfavored. Handlock is favored because they have a lot of uh, pressure. Like if the Handlock deck gets a mountain giant on turn four, freeze mage doesn't really have a good way to deal with him, and they can just deal a lot of damage and win. Yeah. Well, the issue is like um like sometimes like they don't get the mountain giant early on and I feel like a lot of that matchup depends on like whether there's a turn 4 mountain giant. And I think more often than not there isn't a turn 4 mountain giant. So just like based on the stats actually Freeze Mage is slightly favored um by 11 to 7. Are those are those secret stats or public stats? Uh secret but like they're not like particularly meant to be a secret. You know, do you know how many of those games involve Mountain Gen or not? Is that in the stats? Um, uh, no, but it also like there's some handlock lists that don't have Mountain Giants. Like they have the Void Caller versions, and like I feel like those decks, even though they include Melganis, they might be like slightly less favored. That makes sense. So we still waiting to see the first card from Ecop. What is what his deck actually is? We were playing on the BRM board though. This is sweet. Now, wh who does that favor? 
I, I think that that has to favor the warlock because it helps melt the freeze mage. Ah, oh, that makes sense. Well, warlock I was gonna say like fire cards, like hell fire. Oh, okay, okay. I, I might have said, like, it favored the mage because they have, like, Emperor Thorzane, and that's, like, a Black Rock Mountain card. That's, that's, that's reasonable. It's a, it's a good argument. But then, uh, again, the counter-argument is that there's um, imp gang bosses in the zoo if Ekop is indeed playing zoo. Well, I think, actually, the, the fact that uh, Emperor Thorzane was uh, enslaved by Ragnaros uh, sort of means that it's, he's not really necessarily a guy you want to have in your team when you're going up against Ragnaros. He could just turn, turn against you. Yeah, I, he like he's enslaved, but I feel like these days he's like a faithful servant. I, it could be true, but you know who knows what time frame we're in right now because we're actually in Black Rock Mountain. There's Sulphurus sitting right there. Oh, I see. It. Can spectators interact with the board? We've got to make Sulphurus sink. <laughs> All right, so it is it is Zoo from Ecop. He comes out with a pretty uh, pretty fast start. A flame imp surrounded by lava seems like it's in a pretty good position. And uh, Forsen, he has a reasonable draw of his own. He has a couple of uh, a, you know, decent decent uh, card draw with the Arcane Intellect and, and Acolyte of Pain, but not really much to be able to actually allow him to interact a ton with Ecop's board. The way the Zoo player wins is usually by getting a Malganis early on. Uh, a Malganis at the right spot, I mean, uh, later on, or a Doomguard early on. That's like the way Zoo wins, or getting a perfect curve and Freeze Mage drawing badly. But usually Freeze Mage is highly favored in this matchup. Forsen doesn't really have that good of a hand. He needs the Doomsayer, or else he will be in a really bad spot. He has ways to dig, but he hasn't found the key cards just yet. Do? The thing is that if he is forced to use the Frost Nova without a Doomsayer, I don't see him in a good shape. Mm -hmm. And right right now, Ecop doesn't have anything like uh, like Egg or anything to protect him from the board clears. Ooh, and oh. Forsen picks up two more secrets, and you see a, a shake of his head there as he's clearly not happy with that result. Yeah, completely useless right there. He would have had, like, he would have preferred pretty much any other card besides maybe, like, Archmage Antonius. Right? Even only, Archmage Antonius would be better because then the secrets wouldn't be in his hand right now. Yeah, not only not only are those cards not particularly impactful, but they also mean that any, uh, any mad scientist that he draws from now on is going to be quite weak. He only has a single... Actually, I don't even know that he's playing two Ice Barriers. He may even have zero secrets remaining in his deck. That is definitely in favor for Ekop. But at the same time, having double Ice Block helps you survive until Alex, and if you manage to clear the board with an Ice Block on and play Alex, you just win. You don't really want to play Alex on them, you want to use Alex on you. But now it's just uh, how much force and survives. Mm -hmm. That's the question. Well, Ecop looks like he's gonna buff up his. I imagine buff up his one health minions to keep them out of ping range, and just go, go with the SM orc life. It's not even another target, so he doesn't have the uh, the steam wheel sniper problem of having to pick a target. You just drag straight up. Possibility. Only option. What do you think of going for Void Terror? Is like the best card in this matchup, but maybe not now. Maybe. The following turn, if you see, he doesn't have uh, Doomsayer Frost Nova. Because if you play Voiter now and he has Doomsayer Frost Nova, you're in a really bad shape. Hmm. On the other hand, you can play it next turn and put yourself in a really great shape. You can also eat the Argus for more health. Yeah, I, I do. I do like that as a as a possible option. If you're not getting you're not getting uh, Doomsayer here, even if your opponent does Blizzard you, you're able to actually eat some of the small minions that would die to Blizzard anyway and generate a big threat uh, that you can have after the. The freeze is done, and it looks like Forsen may be considering just playing Frost Nova to, to stop uh, damage incoming for a turn. I mean, he is pretty yeah. far away from being able to actually uh, actually Alexstrasza just yet. Ooh, he's pinging. Okay, he wants to. I guess he's looking to both potentially help fill Ecop's well, board here as well as. Uh, Get, just get a little damage on that since he's planning on blizzarding anyway. Yeah. I think a Lothab top deck right now would just close out the game. And we've been seeing a lot of Zoo players in Archon Team League just tech in that Lothab because Freeze Mage and Rogue are so popular in this format. But now he doesn't get it. And uh, yeah, like you mentioned, I think Void Terror could be pretty good right here. Yeah, I think the Void Terror potentially eating the. Uh, so many. The flame, flame and Argus. Yeah, Flame and Argus is what I like. 
Because you Let have me to tap first. Yeah, you, I think you definitely want to life tap. It's also you're looking for damage. You're looking for Pio, you're looking for Loaded, you're looking for Malganis in this matchup and for, for Void Caller. Yep, so, and he goes with. Oh. Not clear yet. He is definitely playing a Void Terry, and he goes with. Okay. Leaves the, the Imp up, gives himself a slightly smaller, uh, slightly smaller Void Terror, but keeping his Imp alive. Hmm. Is there any good reason to that? Isn't just yeah, think, straight up better to give him one more attack? I I, I think that you're you're generally just going to want to have the additional attack. Given your particularly given a force since play last turn, you really expect him to have Blizzard here because he did ping your Imp Gang boss. So it does seem you're kind of just spewing an attack on your minion. Maybe he just really hates non-demon cards because everything that's remaining is a demon, and he ate up the only non-demon minions on the board. That is, he's perhaps trying to. Uh, it, Try to strengthen his theme deck plan. You should like demons more than dragons, Brian. Maybe you play Zoo. <laughs> demons are pretty good. They are, I mean, I, I have had a lot of success casting Bane of Doom. I actually made like a highlight reel video of, of Bane of Dooms on my YouTube channel recently that uh, literally I'm just like saying, I will summon a random Malganus and then Bane of Doom and Malganus comes out. It's great. Yeah, I saw that. It was pretty funny. It's all, sometimes fortunate, right? Uh, frequently fortunate, yeah. Frequently fortunate. <laughs> I have a very different perspective on my, my fortunes in life than some people. <laughs> so it looks like... Kungard looks is a really good play here. Mm -hmm. Kungard yeah, is a really good play here because your opponent just used two freezes and turn seven is usually the flame strike turn and if he uses flame strike he's dead. So he needs yeah, to ice block and dead. play defensively. He has to have another freeze. Yeah. Uh, it looks like he... Oh, there's Doomsayer. But Forsen has already been forced to use his Frost Nova just to prevent damage earlier. He can play, you know, the Articate Intellect can't uh, find a Frost Nova with enough mana, unfortunately, after this. So I think he'll just have to Ice Block this turn. Well, somewhat fortunately, I guess, is that Forsen at least has two Ice Blocks, so he'll survive to Alexstrasza. But I think if he goes for that plan, the turn eight will be extremely important. He'll have to not only draw like ice block, but he'll have to draw like a freeze or just essentially frost nova that exact same turn. Yeah, Forsen really is looking for exactly frost nova or blizzard next turn. I think that he pretty much has no other other road to victory here. He can't win without without ice blocking now, and then without freezing his opponent's board, he's going to have to either ice block. Uh, going on the ice lance okay okay i like this a lot he is he's using an ice lance to keep himself in a position where his opponent has to at least commit more resources to the board in order to actually break his ice block because right now uh ecop has what seven eight nine damage so he is able to break it by playing the direwolf alpha but it it does mean uh from forson's perspective that he you know has to have that additional damage yeah, I think uh, at this point it's like almost like you, you got to say like the zoo ha like it's very likely for the zoo to have those cards, but the, in the small chance that he doesn't, it could be really good for Force in here. I actually like playing Argus here rather than Juggler because Juggler can represent lethal through a freeze. But yeah. here, I like here, yeah. Go ahead. I like playing Gargus because it's a top deck and that will deal Force in. <laughs> and it's the, sa it's the same effectiveness as Dark Wolf Alpha with a better mana use. Yeah, definitely. Wouldn't you have tested the secret first with the 1-1 before playing anything? I think that I, was the better play. I, I agree that I think that's correct, but uh, I agree with you also that, that Tilting Forsen is, uh, is certainly a, a play that I'm interested in. <laughs> and there is the Frost Nova, so that is actually... One might describe frequently fortunate uh, a draw that will keep Forsen alive at least for now, and that actually that that actually bridges him. Ice block, uh, Doomsayer Nova actually bridges him into next turn, what? where he can actually Alexstrasza himself potentially. Though there's still this board that he has to deal with. I guess the Doomsayer is actually going to wipe it. So he's going to ping. Hmm. Whoa. The ping is really good because oh, that, okay, now Echo cannot there, play I have Juggler and Implosion. Right, even if there's an Owl too, yeah. No, the ping is actually excellent. 
Also, Dome Guard. Oh, oh Lothar. Thank you. So, well, hello. yeah, no, that, 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 uh, it's definitely a, a big, uh, a big play from Forsen that works out very well for him. You know, it's actually interesting that maybe if he played Knife Juggler the previous turn, there might be some out here. Um, if he had played knife, well, he had, he'd have to play knife juggler and the 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 direwolf alpha because knife juggler alone doesn't actually lethal. Mm -hmm. And then he would still not have any space on board to implosion his own minions no, to get lethal. Right. Yeah. You don't. But on the other hand, push, yeah, when when yeah. Forsen would ping the Yim Gang boss, he would have a juggler fifty fifty. Yeah, could theoretically kill him. So yeah, no, yeah. this is actually coming up pretty big here. So Forsen has the Oxstraza, goes all the way back up to fifteen. And has that uh, that ice block remaining in his hand. And uh, Dr. Boom, I think, is probably what we'll see. You know, right now, Ecop is in a position where he needs to actually generate enough threat to, to, to break down uh, Forsen's newly reinvigorated life total. He can't just Lotheb and try and close things out because, well, he doesn't actually have any threats in play. And Lothab's already contested by the Alexstrasza. Or he is going with Lothab anyway, though. What do you think about that? It seems like more of a defensive play in some ways. Like, maybe he's just afraid of dying because he's seen his opponent had... He was, like, kind of struggling to deal with the board. And mostly just relying on top decks like that Frost Nova to deal with it, pretty much. Don't you so think he's better to like just play Boom and then play Lothab to seal the deal? That's... That's what I was yeah. thinking. Was the, the play that, that I, I think I would have liked to see would have been, yeah, like juggler into boom, because then your opponent has to deal with boom. Because here, you know, I, I mean, I guess the, 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 the uh, just two fireballs would kill you if you didn't play uh, Lotheb. But I don't know really what's, what exactly his plan is, because he's still getting hit by the Alexstrasza. And now the same thing is true. You know, the, the, the two fireballs are going to kill him next turn. Thanks to the ice block. I guess he didn't know, necessarily know about the ice block, though. Is there any way for Ekop to win? I think he actually is kind of locked out at this point. He doesn't really have the ability to deal with... Uh, both deal enough damage to force in to actually broke, break the ice block and deal with this uh, Alex Straza. I mean, maybe... Yeah. There's some sort of some sort of power overwhelming and implosion or boom, getting lucky with juggles that could work out. I think one way he could somehow have a chance is if he gets Melganus or either or Bane of Doom into Melganus, and that would pretty much yeah. it would protect his life total. It would uh, leave a nine seven threat on the board that pretty much Forsen would have to fireball. So tap into Bane of Doom perhaps. Are you um, really afraid to die? Like, yeah, don't, don't you just go for the best play that puts you in the best spot right now? Right. I, I don't. I don't think that you can. You can be trying to just avoid getting lethal here. I, I think that. I think that you have to try and you know try and play to win in a couple of turns. Because I mean, if if you if your opponent has fireball fireball here, they're just going to kill you. If you you know if you do get a Malganus, I suppose there's some chance that you win, but the, the chances of A, draw, you know, drawing Bane of Doom, and B, actually getting Malganus off of it are both so low that I think that you're better off just hoping your opponent doesn't have it. Here, the, the, the better play and the more risky play was playing uh, Boom, like trading low to then playing Boom. You have three hits and you have to hit twice, and uh, I think I would have liked that more. It's uh, also good because if your opponent ha wants to use the board wipe, he cannot because he dies to the Boom boss. But you need to get lucky, a bit. So Ekop goes for the defensive line of play, and playing defensive in a spot where you lose to two spells is probably not the best idea. I mean, I think this, I think this is a reasonable uh, sort of happy medium here. He, you know, he is still in a position where he's he's not able to break the block this turn, uh, but ooh, juggler. Oh, actually, he quite likely can break the block this turn. Yeah, just go face, juggle, boom. Yeah, and that's actually potentially pretty, pretty good because your your uh, juggler with boom is likely to kill the Thalnos as well, and also, uh, well, that's actually guaranteed oh, to break here, yeah, and and likely kill Thalnos. 
you can still get hit by juggles when you're immune. So he's not guaranteed to kill the Thalnos. It's kind of funny because it's actually not clear he wants to kill Thalnos because it, it, it does give force in another draw to potentially find a second fireball. Why do you have to do that? I mean, yeah, you don't have another option. This is this is the play that is available to you. You can also like, hit face three times, I think. It doesn't matter if you proc the block. I, right. I think yeah. it still hits. That's what I was saying. Even if you're even if you're immune, the juggles can still hit your face. They just don't do anything. Yeah. As we see there. So now Forsen <laughs> is really wants to draw a fireball and did not get it off that and no, it looks to me like he just walked away from his computer, but <laughs> he doesn't have any ice box left. Uh, anti healbot is not enough to keep him alive. He can't even heal bot fireball ping to kill Dr. Boom. I think this game is over. Mm. You see, he got covering his eyes. He's just like, don't kill me. Don't kill me, please. <laughs> he pretty much needs a third Frost Nova in his deck. And even if that happens, like pretty much any minion would kill him with a knife juggle. I mean, I think if I'm in Ecop's position, I know this game is over because Forsen hasn't emoted yet. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe he squelched him. I don't know. <laughs> Even though he never, he says that he never squelches people. Like, do you Again, guys? Again, it's uh, a double-edged sword. Like, if if you squelch him, uh, he might not uh, emote you. But if you don't squelch him, you'll know if he has the Oh, one card One too card too late is the second fireball. I don't think there's anything lucky. that Forsen could have drawn there. He'd already played both Novas, he'd already uh, played both blocks. I don't think there's anything that keeps him alive from that position. Yeah. Uh, but one card too late, fireball number two, and Ecop takes the uh, takes the lead five to three for Cloud9. And that leaves, uh, I believe it is just Kalento to win. Yeah, with his freeze mage, it would be really interesting. It's like freeze mage versus freeze mage, and then freeze mage versus aggro Pali, and then freeze mage versus rogue. So definitely, Cloud9 is favored. When you have like mirror match and something else, you're definitely favored. But that's not always how it goes. Like uh, us versus Team Liquid last time. Yeah, I mean definitely. Well, well, I believe that Cloud9 is certainly in an excellent position here. I would way rather be in in their shoes than uh, than those of the Forsen boys. Uh, it can really go either way. Yeah, yeah. We've definitely seen the, some major comebacks. I think like the one difference between uh, the position that Cloud9 is in versus the position that Team Liquid was in last week is that Team Liquid, even though we had Patron Warrior left and five games to win, or rather four games to win, most of the matchups were either like even or unfavorable for the Patron Warrior. Whereas uh, right here, the Freeze Mage is at least even or favored against a lot of uh, the decks remaining from Force and Boys. I, I don't really see uh, Kalento having a hard time with really any of these decks. I mean, as as we were saying earlier, Chalky feels that he's disadvantaged, I believe, playing the uh, the Paladin, Aggro Paladin deck against Freeze Mage. Uh, generally, and, and maybe the secret stats can back me up on this, uh, the Rogue matchup is also uh, very much in favor of Freeze Mage as well. And then the Mirror match can only be so bad. Yeah, the Freeze Mage versus Oil Rogue, according to the stats, is exactly 66%. There's 16 wins and 8 losses for the Freeze Mage. I believe uh, Leroy Jenkins and crew would be be sad that there's no repeating, of course, in there. But oh, it's not exactly. Sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, it's sixty-six <laughs> point repeating, of course. Yeah. Of course, of course. To be a completely accurate there if we're talking about stats. <laughs> but yeah, just like with Freeze Mage, I think it's been like the weak deck so far uh, for both lineups. We haven't seen a single win from either Freeze Mage, as we can see from both mages uh, still having their color remaining. I mean, I'm colorblind. I can only really see check marks. Okay. No check marks on the faces, pretty much. I'm not kidding that I'm colorblind, but I'm kidding that I can't see them. Anyway, uh, but yeah, so if you are in the position of the Forsen boys, uh, game count does matter. It is the, the tiebreaker for standings, and it looks like they are going with their, their, their mirror match. And this is, when you're sending in a mirror match, that means that you really don't, as you know, your last sort of ditch effort, you can't possibly think your other matchups are good. You know, you... You have to think that this is our best chance of picking up another win, and it is 50-50. Yeah, exactly. And it just speaks to the testament that I think everyone agrees that Freeze Mage is favored, but also just like the Force and Boys in general believe that the Agro uh, Paladin is unfavored against Kalento's Freeze Mage. Mm -hmm. one, one funny thing is that people consider Freeze Mage as being possibly the hardest deck. I'm not sure if it's harder than Patreon, but it's definitely a really hard deck to play. But the Mirror Match 
doesn't require that much skill. Usually the person that draws the cards in the right order wins. Like who Alex is first has a huge advantage. The person that has the kill bot at the right time, the person that has the first scientist, the, the person that makes the other guy overdraw, and the person that has first emperor usually is the one that wins too. Oh, so it's like a lot of uh, the first one that has it situation. What about, what, what about, what about the, the player? <laughs> Go ahead. I think I think I know say the same say. thing. I'm like, what about the first player to draw two flame strikes? <laughs> what sort of position are they in? I would say that player is never lucky. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Kalento has an excellent hand here. He actually has yeah. Emperor, he has Archmage, he has a, a Mad Scientist, while Forsen has... <laughs> double Frost, double wow. Frost, like, double Blizzard. He has 26... ...really particularly valuable in this matchup. If Forsen yeah. wins this one, he's the best Freeze Mage player in the world. Or he just gets really lucky from here on out. Yeah, yeah. one of those. <laughs> The thing what is, like, it's definitely the case. I think if Forsen could, like, pick all of his remaining draws, he still might not win. Just because, like, yeah, Kalanto's hand is just insane right now. Emperor on five, even. Like, that would be pretty amazing with this hand. It is definitely, uh, definitely a much, much better hand than Forsen, which is probably the worst, the worst Freeze Mage Mirror hand imaginable. Oh, look, it got better. It got a Doomsayer. He has even more ways to clear the board. Oh, man. Yeah, clear the that thing, scientist. I don't think we've, like, uh, touched upon enough, like, how bad these, like, spells are, because in this matchup, typically you just want to throw them away. Like, you'd rather just not have them in your, in your hand, because they, like, they clog up space in your hand. It is literally worse than not having these cards in his hand at all, I think. Yeah. Like, if, 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 if he could have mulliganed and just gotten less cards, I think he'd be happier, assuming that he could no longer draw those. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Kalento here, he has the opportunity to, uh, to potentially play an Acolyte, maybe get a little bit more card draw uh, before he does play that Emperor. It looks like he's just going to go with trading the, trading the Mad Scientist and playing that Acolyte. Yeah. There's also an interesting dynamic here in that when secrets are up from the Freeze Mage, si Freeze Mage player side, like you pretty much never want to attack your opponent because you want to do most of your damage or all of your damage via burn rather than activating these ice barriers. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much the last attack we'll see in this game to ah. the face, unless an Alexstrasza comes onto what the field. To do? What to do? Yeah, it is definitely uh, just just a downside to attack beyond a certain point. It, it looks like Forsen is just considering thro throwing out that Doomsayer to... It's actually not bad, because not, not only does it deny uh, uh, multiple card draws from Kalento on that Acolyte, it also denies Kalento from actually being able to coin into his Emperor this turn, which was otherwise a possibly very strong play. And right now, well, how many cards are in Kalento's hand? It looks like quite a few. I think he overdraws if he plays Arcane Missile, Arcane Intellect. What to do? If he uh, I think Intellect... I think he's fine. He's he'll be at ten cards, so he can just like throw out the coin. And I don't even think the coin is like. I guess it's valuable with the Archmage Antonidas, but you don't necessarily need it. Yeah, it's a free fireball. It's like really good. I think. I think he just wants to draw something that he can play. Oh like no, he needs that, to play the Mad Scientist. But yeah, the, you 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 definitely want to value the coin in this matchup. It's really important. It's one of the ways you can uh, either get your, your Alex faster and put your opponent on the clock. For example, you can go like Emperor into Coin Alex and just win. Or he can use the coin to get more fireballs, therefore getting a lot of value. Forsen is definitely not happy with that hand. <laughs> I can't imagine why. I mean, he, has, he has three cards you could play this turn. He could Blizzard, Fireball, or play another Blizzard. I think the play is so Blizzard. I think you actually play Blizzard because you don't want to have dead cards. In this oh, matchup, you usually play Flames like and Blizzard on the empty board most of the time. I, I mean, oh, he's just, he wants his ping. Well, the thing is, not only has Forsen not draw any of the valuable cards that he needs, he hasn't drawn any cards that allow him to draw more cards. So he's right. even, uh, it's, it's like even a worse position for him. And I think like it's going to be pretty obvious what the next few turns are. Fireball to the Emperor, and then Kalento will just like completely win from there. 
And Frost Nova, another not particularly exciting card here. I think at this point... He's getting all the freeze from last game. Yeah. I think at this point, Forsen is hoping, hey, maybe I'll survive to ten turn, ten, turn 10, and then I'll be able to Arc Mage and Frost Nova. That's pretty good, I guess. So just coin Alex Straza for Kalanto, putting Forsen down to 15, and leaving him with that Alex. Oh my god, another Frost Nova! He would, this, is, this would be a really good poker hand. Yeah, three pair. And two very high cards. Excellent kickers. This is... I, I actually... I, I don't know that I've ever seen a worse series of draws in a Hearthstone game than these. This is actually just remarkable. I yeah, these are... By actually how never lucky Forsen has been this game. I think the only card that Forsen actually wanted was the Mad Scientist. And he got that and then pretty much the worst cards he could have drawn. Like the six cards that were in his hand, but the, all the AoEs, you never want to draw in this matchup. You want them to be in the last six cards in your deck. Mm -hmm. I think if Forsen, he could somehow like flip around his entire deck, he would be in a great position right now. <laughs> so if you're if you're in Kalento's seat, I mean, not that not that there's many plays you can make that don't win the game, but what's the best of them? It's just you just Archmage, Frostbolt, Ice Lance your opponent. Wasn't it just sure. better to proc your opponent's block? Can you? I think you could, right? With what? Frostbolt, Frostbolt, Ice Lance? Uh, Frostbolt, so. Ice Lance, Fireball? Frostbolt, he had mana for everything? Well, he just he only got the Fireball from uh, the Antonitis, right? I think he had one Fireball. He had one Fireball. He had one Fireball. Yeah, right, and the two right. mana Frostbolt, so that's six mana, plus one, plus zero. So he could pack the block. Uh, yeah, maybe that is better. What to do? I think whatever you do, you still win. There's, I know what you do. Yeah, that's, that's the thing is you're 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 in a position where, you know, you just have an embarrassment of riches. Your opponent has basically nothing and has, you know, demonstrated that by pinging on turn six. So it it, it is very difficult to find a way to lose this game if you're in Kalento's position. Yeah. So I think, I Kalento, would say it's impossible. Definitely. I think Kalento he drew like around four more cards than Force in this game. But he has only two AoEs versus Forsen's six AoEs that he had. Mm -hmm. That's one counterpart of playing uh, double Flame Strike and double Blizzard. Many people just play one one and maybe a heal bot, and that's it. But Forsen yeah, wanted think, to have a lot of removal. Um, I think that might be like speaking to the patron matchup because the second Flame Strike actually helps the patron matchup a lot, just clearing off a lot of threats. But I feel like it makes a lot of your other matchups a lot weaker, as we can see here. Is that matchup bad enough to justify running uh, double flame strike? Like, do you really want to win versus Warrior that just beats you by armoring up? What are your stats on that matchup, Monk? Uh, <laughs> it's it's pretty crazy. It's like seventy percent. It's uh, Patron Warrior has a seventy three percent win rate. I'm pretty sure that by this point is already threat with all the stats that you just said on this stream. <laughs> and Forsen yeah. just... He's had enough. Just... Exactly. Yeah. Despite the game actually not being quite over yet, uh, it was very clearly unwinnable. And uh, Cloud9 takes down Forsen boys, uh, with Forsen himself unable to find a win with Freeze Mage. Yeah, Forsen boys had a really good start off with this league going 2-0, but they've just kind of like lost the last two matches unexpectedly and actually both these teams now are at two and two so pretty much everyone is uh a force in his bench of course everyone <laughs> is around the same uh level either three Still one two two is that why that's up there but <laughs> uh, it makes a lot of sense force can pretty much never play again they will face us next week so now we have an advantage Kappa. Yeah, there you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah so Right now, let's take a let's. I think it's time to take a look at the standings for um, just the remainder of the day. Okay, Where are they? maybe not. Are they in your there? They are. Time? Okay, there we go. Yeah, so everyone is around even, like we said, but it's it's kind of like Team Archon's position, or Team Archon is in a position to take a quite a hefty lead because I think they play Team Liquid next. Um, if Team Liquid and Team Archon they kind of like even up, then it's very possible that most of the teams will go to 2-2. Two, two. 
But I think the the key matchup for tomorrow will be whoever Celestial plays, and I believe they'll play Temple Storm. I think no, they already played Temple Storm last week. So uh, who else on tomorrow? Uh, Liquid. Liquid. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's a pretty big match because if Archon is able to win, they will pull themselves into the three way tie for first place. Um, while if Liquid is able to win, uh, they will sort of dig themselves out of uh, their their poor start and uh, you know be sort of in the the scrum in the middle of the standings. Oh yeah. So I think uh, yeah, it is Tempo Swarm versus Celestial uh, tomorrow, and that's going to be like the battle of like who can escape last place because whoever loses that match will definitely go to last place. Uh, I would think. I actually, and it's very possible. I actually think that if if if, if Tempo Storm uh, loses, they may still uh, end up uh, holding on to sixth place simply because of the game differential. If you look at Tempo Storm, currently has fourteen wins, Celestial's ten. So if Celestial wins, they'll have sixteen. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Games tomorrow, uh, they they will uh, remain in sixth place even with a loss. Yeah, I think Team Celestial has been like the team that has been disappointing the most lately because they're a team with like Science Storm who recently won an ESL, Taylor who won DreamHack, and just everyone was really expecting them to be one of the top four teams, I would say. But then you have like Frozen Ice for a lot of people who think that he might be the weak link because he has, I believe, a 2-10 record so far in Archon League. I mean, when when a team is doing uh, you know is doing poorly, there's going to be someone with bad record. So oh, definitely. Wh- whether that's whether that's due to you know the players' uh, in-game choices, their the team's deck selection overall. Uh, because frankly, and this is something that that Sixo mentioned on Twitter a while ago, uh, you know, someone has to play the decks that are generally identified as the weaker decks. You know, not everyone gets to play Patron or Handlock or whatever. Some of us get stuck with with Shaman, and you know, we gotta we gotta win with those. But <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Of course, for standings and for desk lists, you can also go to uh, teamarchon.com slash league where you'll find pretty much all the info about the Archon League, including the schedule, uh, of course, deck lists, uh, and pretty much all there is to know about Archon League. Um, I think that almost is over, but before uh, we close out the day, we have to give a small shout out to our sponsors, Amazon and Alpha Draft. Again, with Alpha Draft, you can make your own fantasy ATLC team. Uh, just follow their progress overall and win your share of three hundred thousand dollars given out from Alpha Draft. So it's a pretty sweet thing. Um, and finally, yeah, we just have to close it out for the rest of the day. I think. Do you guys have any uh, final thoughts? It's uh, a really I close think- battle between uh, the top teams. I hope uh, Nylum d- does well next week. <laughs> well, I hope Value Town does well next week. <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, I don't know we- what I hope. I mean, there's definitely there's definitely been a lot of great matches, uh, both individual games and overall matches between teams so far. And uh, you know, the league has been a ton of fun, and uh, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, to continuing to play in future weeks. Yeah, of course, Liquid is always uh, looking forward to play. I know you guys had your day in the sun today, but be t- stay tuned for tomorrow, where Liquid will face off against Archon, and Tempo Storm will face off against Celestial. I think that's all we have for today. Uh, thanks for watching, guys.